point uh, in the uh, in the school year. Uh, the next one down here uh, is for unemployment. And uh, this is a uh, transfer of $105,000 into the unemployment account uh, because of COVID. Uh, there were some additional unemployment expenses that the district has incurred. Uh, we've reported that in the past. And so this is to, uh, uh, to cover that uh, uh, shortfall in that particular account. And then there's three additional transfers here for the uh, Human Resources Department. Uh, and this is to cover shortfalls in substitute accounts that gets covered from the Human Resources Department budget. Uh, two small transfers here into wage accounts uh, within central office uh, the, uh, for the uh, uh, central administration support team and for a non-affiliated uh, position uh, within central office. Um, scrolling on down, um, the um, next one is $150,000 transfer into instructional supplies within curriculum. And uh, this is from wages uh, to cover the uh, Bridges uh, Mathematics uh, Curriculum Program. And uh, so that's $150,000. There's additional money in the wage accounts due to some delays in hiring within curriculum, as well as some positions that came in lower than was originally budgeted. Um, then you have uh, a couple of transfers here in facilities, uh, $50,000 for uh, natural gas at Brian McMahon and $13,500 for electric also at Brian McMahon. Uh, <clears throat> and then we've got two transfers at Fox Run uh, for this is for the purchase of uh, View, uh, View Sonic boards. And uh, the funds are coming uh, from an other professional services account <clears throat> within uh, the Fox Run budget. Uh, and then the last transfer on the list is also a special education transfer. And this is uh, to cover um, the movement of a uh, teacher uh, at Marvin uh, that was originally budgeted in the excess cost grant. And we've moved it to local for state reporting purposes. And just sort of by way of background, um, there's a sort of a fine dance that we have to do in order to maximize our various grant funds. And um, we wanna make sure that if we have a uh, particular student who's likely going to um, uh, cost more than the excess cost threshold, we wanna make sure that we're paying for it from uh, local bu uh, budget dollars so that we can then claim it uh, for excess cost. And so in this case, we had the position originally budgeted in excess cost, uh, but we're moving it out of the excess cost grant so that we can claim the position uh, for excess cost, if that, if that makes sense. And uh, so that transfer is for $125,000. And that concludes the transfers on the agenda tonight. Uh, there, are there any questions? I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Tom. I, you know, um, yes, I appreciate uh, that. And again, thanks for um, uh, joining us tonight to go through that. Um, one kind of general question, when, when we were transferring money into the special ed accounts uh, from out of district tuition, is that uh, generally a, 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 an offset? Um, I guess what I'm asking is, are we going to end up spending less than, than we planned for an out of district tuition? Yes, yes, uh, there's, there's excess money in the out of district tuition account as the number of students who are outplaced has declined over the last several years. So, uh, so yes, there will be savings in, in the out of district tuition accounts as a result of that. Fantastic, thank you. Any other questions, comments about the transfers? Okay. 
Hearing none, seeing none, um, Tom, thank you. Um, we, can, um, we can address the actual vote um, as part of the action item tonight, uh, later on in the agenda, but I, uh, I appreciate Tom, you giving us some insight into uh, the transfers and answering any of our questions. Sure, happy to, happy to do You'll that. You'll stick around too on your vacation. There, <laughs> you, you do have the financial report at the end of the agenda. So I was also planning to be here for that, but uh, um, so. Okay, well, if you wanna take a break and come back. I, I can I do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Of course, thank you. The next item on the agenda, on, uh, on the regular schedule agenda, is our spotlight. And tonight we are shining a spotlight on National Social Emotion Emotional Learning Arts Day. Dr. Yazima, are you ready to share more about that with us? Give me one second while I just pull that up again. Yes. <clears throat> throughout the school year, throughout the school year and the many challenges that staff and students have faced during the public health crisis, developing social and emotional learning skills has been critical to help students feel safe and supported. The Board of Education is proud to recognize the staff and students who engaged and participated in Norwalk's Social Emotional Learning Day throughout the arts, which took place across the district in late March. <clears throat> Realizing the national step to acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage emotions, and achieve personal and collective goals, we know that social emotional learning also enhances students' capacity to deal with everyday issues. When it combined with the arts, students can learn, practice, and develop their social emotional skills while building self-awareness, empathy, and patience. From emotions pokey pokey to whole school mediation and belly breathing, NPS teachers develop creative ways to infuse the arts in their classrooms to celebrate national social emotional learning. Students express feelings through word clouds, drawing, poetry, songwriting, dance, role playing, mindfulness activities, deep breathing, and stretching activities. Students at each level focus on a specific goal for the day. Elementary students learn how to identify and name feelings. Middle school students focus on how to put feelings into words. And high school students discuss who to share feelings with. National Social Emotional Day is an initiative celebrated throughout the country through the Action Network, which is a national alliance for social emotional learning. We are very proud of our students and staff are doing such a great job using social emotional learning in the arts. Please enjoy this compilation video highlighting student work on this very special day.
Wonderful. Thank you, Ralph. And thank you to uh, everyone in our learning community who is making social emotional learning uh, a, an important part of our, uh, our educational experience. I think um, we all need it, especially now, uh, no matter how old we are. Thank you, Godfrey. Um, and so moving on on the agenda, we do have a uh, public comment next. Um, we did get a lot of public comments emailed and there may be folks who are in attendance tonight who would like to speak. Um, I'm gonna read uh, some of them, but also kind of, uh, I want to contextualize uh, one of the items that a lot of the comments are about. Uh, our first comment is from, uh, emailed comment is from Daisy Sebastian who writes, Dear Board of Education and Dr. Estrella, last month I spoke at the Board of Education meeting pleading for attention and changes to be made in the food, ser food being served at our, at our schools, in particular at the elementary level. Even though there were some positive changes made, there is still work to be done. There are even better food choices being offered by Chartwells to districts like Westport and Scarsdale, so why not for our kids too? Please reinstate the wellness committee so that Chartwells is directly accountable to this board and our community. It should be absolutely unacceptable for Chartwells to send our schools high sugar and processed foods. The second item I would like to bring up for tonight is the results from the spring break survey. What percentage of parents completed the survey were teachers given the opportunity to participate? And will parents have the opportunity to speak to the board for this change to be implemented for the 2021-22 calendar? Oh, thank you, Daisy. Next, we have a comment from Morgan Minoff. Dear Board of Education and Dr. Estrella, my name is Morgan Minoff and I'm a junior at Norwalk High School. A couple of weeks ago, a decision was made by the superintendent about junior and senior prom for both high schools. The senior class will still be having a prom, but the junior class will not be having a prom. I would like to know the reason for the decision since all of the guidelines placed on the senior prom can also be placed on a junior prom. I understand that it is very important for the senior class to have a senior prom since they did not have a junior prom. But the junior class has not had a formal dance throughout high school so far. If guidelines allow prom to happen, why wouldn't it be placed on both of the classes to allow both to experience what would traditionally be experienced? As we've seen since the start of COVID-19, there could be reasons in the future that might not allow us to have dances next year. So why not take advantage of the time we have now? Uh, thank you, Morgan. Um, before we do the rest, I, would, I want to um, make a short statement to say that we have received many email comments about the topic, the proposed topic of redistricting. And there may be some folks present tonight here who may wanna bring it up as well. So before I, I go through some of these comments, I wanna clarify that what is on tonight's agenda is only the newest demographic study results in our public schools. We're gonna hear from our longtime demographer who will present data that's similar to what has pre been presented in the past, basically a broad, holistic, multi-scenario perspective on school population trends for the next few years. Uh, it's gonna include all kinds of scenarios regarding uh, school populations, but I think it's important to clarify that redistricting is not a topic that this board has broached or considered or discussed or currently has any plans to discuss. And we would never consider doing that unilaterally. I do regret that the posting of tonight's presentation in advance without some proper context has very understandably upset many members of our community. But I do wanna clarify uh, and hopefully offer some relief that redistricting is not something that this board is considering tonight or has any uh, short-term plans to consider. So I hope we all look forward to hearing more about this demographic study tonight. Uh, that said, I do wanna make sure that everybody's voice is heard. So I, I will be reading from the public comments, but in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, read excerpts from the emailed comments um, and um, uh, note that every comment that was emailed in will be uh, included in full for the public record. So there's a lot, so I'm gonna go through very quickly. Um, first is from Allie and Stephen Talbot of One Acorn Lane who write in part, we purchased our home on, the, on an expressed expectation of the school district and proximity to schools our future children would attend. 
Our home price reflected the choice to purchase a home in a robust district with strong resources and above average test scores. We have improved our home using comparable properties districted to Rewayton Elementary and Roten Middle as a measuring tool. Redistricting would have, us, would have had us all over improve way beyond any returns we would ever see. How would the town compensate us for this drop in resale value? Uh, thank you, Allie and Stephen. We have a comment from Karen Rossi, uh, no address, who writes, as a newer resident in this area, I was recently made aware of the discussions around redistricting Nora Public Schools that would include a shift of our neighborhood away from Rewayton Elementary and Rewayton Middle School. I, strongly, I am strongly opposed to this proposal for many reasons, most of which I have detailed below. And I'm not gonna read the entire thing, but thank you, Karen, for your input. Uh, Tracy Bailey writes, the city of Norwalk is now over 75% minority. Once that point is reached, there is no longer a need to racially rebalance. So redistricting becomes null and void. Isn't this a federal law? Redistricting serves no purpose and does not achieve the goal of enhancing equity for South Norwalk residents. Thank you, Trisha. Next, we have a comment from Kathy Malone, uh, no address. I would like to understand the timeline and proposed new districts for elementary school in Rewayton, as well as the rationale behind this redistricting. Having a current student, I would like to know if we should expect to have him move schools in the middle of his time in elementary school. Next, we have a comment from Jill Slachta, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, from 33 Vanderbilt Avenue, who writes, in part, we purchased our property in 2016 specifically for the school the location was District 2. With this in mind, we paid a premium relative to other parts of Norwalk to get into Rewayton and Rotten schools. We have spent less purchasing the same size house in any other schools in the proposed plans. Thank you, Bill. Next comment is from Drew Wisher, who writes in part, Scenarios four to six speak about neighborhood preference, which would feed Columbus at varying rates. Would you please define slash clarify the phrase neighborhood preference as it relates to these scenarios? Thank you, Drew. Next, we have a comment from Amy Turiel, uh, 32 Vanderbilt Avenue, who writes in part, our kids will soon no longer be personally affected by this proposed change, but the value of our home certainly will be. Our retirement is connected to the resale value of this home. And I know that many of the families with babies and young children who've recently bought, who recently become our neighbors, would move out of the neighborhood if this change were to happen as they have also shared that Rowayton School was a draw for them. This would also have a negative effect on property values. And thank you, Amy. Next, we have a comment from Kim Krieger at Free McAllister Avenue, who writes in part, ripping apart that community would be a great disservice to the school, the families, and the city. Please do give students in unassigned areas of South Norwalk their own community school, but please don't destroy a working, healthy school in South Norwalk to do it. She's talking about Brookside Elementary. Thank you, Kim. Next, we have a comment from Megan Sibald, hope I'm correct, uh, pronouncing that correctly, who writes in part, it is difficult to take the language about equity seriously without a guarantee that all Norwalk public schools, including Brookside and the proposed new schools will be fairly funded and properly resourced. In fact, I find it hard to believe anyone could support such a drastic overhaul of the system without immediate action targeted at fixing the existing flaws in the system. Thank you, Megan. Laura Sheehy and Brian Sheehy write in part, we plan to fight this change and we'll be reaching out for legal guidance. We hope that this plan is reconsidered based on how much this will negatively impact our family and the families that live in Rowayton just north of the train tracks. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Brian. Next is Christina Val, or Bali, sorry, uh, who writes in part, we bought our house on Possum Circle over 14 years ago and are raising three children here. The chief reason we selected this neighborhood was for the school, namely Rowayton Elementary. Since that time, Rowayton has become our community. Changing the school changes this as well. Our children play sports in Rowayton, do all their activities in Rowayton, and our family friends are here in Rowayton. We moved into a community, not just a school, and we paid a premium for it. Thank you so much, Christina. Next, we have Jeff Mangan at 18 Meeker Court, who writes, 
in part, will you cover this, this decrease in our property value because we no longer enroll in school? Will you retroactively refund the extra property taxes we pay to live here? What happens if we decide to move because of your short-sighted half-baked plans? We'll take a massive hit because less people want to, will want to move here. Don't pretend that there isn't a premium on a real estate to be in the Rowayton School District. Thank you so much, Jeff. Next, we have Lisa Mangan at Meeker Court, who writes in part, it is very clear that the redistricting proposal merely shifts the burden of long bus rides, et cetera, rather than to actually solve the issues. It is very unfair to entire neighborhoods of families, and I am vehemently opposed to these proposed redistricting, redistricting scenarios. Thank you, Lisa. Raul Esparza writes in part, um, at, sorry, at 27 Vanderbilt Avenue, writes in part, with the main objective of the planning scenarios is to enhance equity for South Norwalk students, I do not see how utilization or minority ratios will be improved by rezoning this small section of Rowayton. The utilization metric for Brookside Elementary would be at full capacity under the proposed scenarios, which is not a good thing, and minority ratios would only be marginally impacted. Furthermore, the change in minority percentage at Rowayton Elementary would actually dip. Hence, the disruption to a small portion of the Rowayton community does not seem warranted by any of the scenarios. Thank you, Raul. Next, we have Tori Sager, who writes in part, sorry, uh, Tori and John Sager of 36 Vanderbilt Avenue, who write in part, we are strongly against the proposed redistricting scenario put forth in the Board of Education materials. We see in the materials, you mentioned a primary objective is to improve community slash family access to neighborhood schools. For everyone in our neighborhood, this proposal does not meet this objective. Thank you, Tori. Next we have uh, Terry and Bonnie Underwood who write in part, we struggled to buy our home here after renting for a period. We moved ahead knowing that Rowayton would provide the kind of social and academic maturation we wanted for our son and family. Please leave this district intact. Thank you, Terry and Bonnie. Next we have Trevor Birchabase who writes in part, this current report needs to be immediately rescinded for fear of its mere existence impacting our community and property values. It is vitally important that this small community you have carved out remain restricted to Rowayton Roten schools without question. Thank you, Trevor. Next we have Rich and Elizabeth Burt, who write in part, I can't, I, sorry, I can't imagine but this isn't the only note you have received regarding this issue. And I look forward to hearing the reasoning behind these proposals at tonight's hearing. My wife and I reviewed the board packet and did not see a compelling argument as to why our neighborhood should be involved at all. Thank you, Rich and Elizabeth. Next we have, we're getting there, we're, we're more than halfway through. Uh, Jillian Jason, who writes in part, please reconsider this, decision, this discussion and rather than disruption and unfairness, Think about how you can reallocate resources to support the current zoning. Thank you, Jillian. Next, we have Stephen, uh, sorry, Stephen Karens, or Sivan, I apologize, who writes in part, please make sure this conversation is not tabled or made light of. The right thing to do after you hear all of our voices via email or during the meeting tonight is to demand a redraw of the district maps and provide an official statement that we will not be redistricted and our plans for our kids and our futures will not be tampered with. Thank you, Simon. Next, we have Jess DePenfilis, who writes in part, Jess and Adam, I'm sorry, uh, Jessica and Adam DePenfilis, who write in part, when using the, the goal of equity as the basis for redistricting by shifting our neighborhood, how is that accomplished? Did the consultant you, uh, use conduct interviews with parents and principals where their community breakout sessions that took place? Thank you in advance for your time. Thank you, Jessica and Adam. Connor Stodden writes in part, the economic impact of the pros redistricting would be immense. We chose to live in Rowayton for the strength of its school system. We have been involved in civic, social, and economic participants in the community since moving in 2015. We have invested time, focus, and money in our community, as well as our homes. We do all this because we are proud to live in Rowayton. The proposed redistricting would result in a massive diminution, diminution of property values. Thank you, Connor. Next, we have Kim Hopkins, who writes in part, Kim is a uh, eight Boston circle. My fellow neighbors have taken a strong stance and are prepared to fight for our rights to remain in the Rowayton and Rowayton schools. 
I will attend the meeting tonight to voice my objections. Thank you, Kim. Next, we have Patrick Maloney at 374 Wayton Avenue, who writes in part, under any of these proposals, our daughter's quality of education is lower and she will be in more crowded classrooms. She will not be within walking distance of her middle school and it will limit her participation in free and post class activities and our housing value decreases and our daughter could not hypothetically attend school with her other relatives in her way. Thank you very much, Patrick. Next we have Erin Maloney who writes in part, under any of these proposals, our daughter's quality of education will be negatively affected and our housing value decreases. I 100% oppose these potential changes. We are prepared to fight for our right to remain in the Rewaken and Broken Schools. Thank you, Erin. Next we have Lorianne Caraglia of Arnold Lane, who writes in part, first of all, Arnold Lane is physically located in Rewaken. Second of all, I pay higher taxes in Rewaken versus Norwalk residents. Third, I purchased my home knowing my children would attend Rewaken and Roten that anyone I sold my house to would also attend those schools. Thank you, Lori Ann. Next, we have Timmy Davies of 15 Possum Lane, who writes in part, redistricting, we would lose value to our house that we have spent time and money on updates over the years. I, I kindly ask you to consider the folks that have invested in their community and spent the money to attend their preferred school district. Thank you for taking your time to read my email. Thank you, Kimberly. Next, we have Scott Peterson of Nine Acorn Lane, who writes in part, aside from the financial aspect, we have invested a lot of our own time into the schools as parents to coach in Little League, et cetera, to ensure our kids are raised in an environment conducive to family-oriented community. The schools are the center of any community and parental involvement is reflected in the result of good schools. Thank you, Scott. Next, we have Elaine Pagano of 23 Byers Street, who writes in part, I would like to go on record as opposing the proposed redistricting of the section of Rowayton slash Roten School District, north of the Rowayton Railroad Station, on the grounds that it would be discriminatory. The homes in this neighborhood are some of the most affordable part of the district and changing them would be prejudicial to our community. Thank you, Elaine. Next, we have Florian Hill of 26 Maple Court, who writes in part, we are paying significantly higher taxes, specifically we wanted, because we wanted to be in the Rowayton School District. How can you, after all these years, just decide to zone us to a different school? We live in Rowayton, so keep it zoned to Rowayton, please. Thank you, Florian. Next, we have Heather Schneider, who writes in part, if you eliminate these proposed neighborhoods from attending Rowayton Elementary, the school will only have two classes, the affluent, many of these district families attend private schools, and the less fortunate. Rowayton Elementary needs these middle-class families to remain in the district to help round out these extreme socioeconomic differences. Norwalk currently enjoys school choice. Why not redistrict by choice? Thank you, Heather. Next, we have Garrett Friedrichsen, who writes in part, I'm really surprised this would even be an option discussed. Rowayton Elementary and Roten Middle School already admit much of their students from outside the district, and those students benefit from the advocacy, volunteerism, and presence of the local parents. If local kids can't attend Rowayton School, do you think the community will continue to support and fund these schools. Thank you, Garrett. Um, and then I'm going to read an excerpt from um, an email we got. Uh, the text of the email was received from um, a, a number of uh, parents. It's uh, uh, almost identical text. So I'll read an excerpt from the text and just list the name of the community members. Uh, it says in part, I'm writing today to let you know that I'm strongly opposed to this proposal for many reasons, most of which I've detailed below. Based off the current proposed scenarios by the board, it appears we are materially, adversely, and disproportionately affected in all scenarios, and it doesn't seem to achieve any overall goal by just affecting our neighborhoods. Uh, this was a, a, a note sent in by the following community members, Yanetsi Diaz, Pablo Castellanos, Jen and Jeff Ferris, Christopher Calby, Caitlin Hannum, Kelly Wood, Lauren Morrell, John Paul Morrell, Brendan Rafferty, Jamie Rafferty, Elizabeth Wolf, James Wolf, Rebecca McC McCarty, Peggy Peterson, Raphael Rizendi, Eric Magleby, Amanda Magleby, Scott, Matthew Scott, and Jerome Edwards. 
Um, again, I, I first of all want to deeply thank everyone who sent a note in. Um, I'm actually extremely pleased. I think this kind of parent, uh, parent and community advocacy is a really, really, really great sign of how vibrant the Newark School District is. This is um, really, really gratifying. I, I, I also, so I wanted to read those to make sure that everybody had their voice heard and against, and again, the entire statements are, are going to be in the public record. But I also want to make sure that everybody understands that uh, the suggestion that the NOAA Board of Education is considering redistricting uh, is not based in anything that I, as the chair of the board, I'm aware of. So again, I, I'm so pleased and grateful for our uh, community uh, involvement and advocacy. Um, I encourage more of it and thank you. Um, and I also uh, invite us all to listen to the full the, the democracy report to learn more about uh, one perspective or, or some perspectives on uh, Newark school population over the next few years. Colin, do you mind if I say something really quickly before we move on? Is that okay? Uh, yes, I want. I wanted to invite anybody in attendance tonight. If they oh, wanted. I'm sorry. I'll wait after for after for sure. Yeah. So those were the, the comments we had emailed, and I also want to invite anybody uh, in attendance virtually tonight if they want to make a statement. Uh, you have three minutes. So yeah. So Colin, yeah, thank you for reminding me of three minutes. I think um, Brenda's going to help me with giving a thirty second. Um, uh, warning. Um, but anybody that's interested, it seems like a lot of people that I think are in our attendees actually were the ones that also placed the comments. But if you are interested in making any public comments, please just raise your hand. Uh, and um, just make sure you uh, once again state state your name when when, uh, when when this first comes. This first one is labeled as fines. So uh, let me um, so. Uh, Finds you. Uh, you can. Uh, you can uh, unmute yourself. Oops. Hello, Mr. Fines. Okay. Is there anybody else that would like to make public comments that are, are in the attendees? Okay, uh, it's uh, Sivan Karens is the next person to speak. So uh, Sivan, you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, thank you for reading our notes. Um, thank you for, you know, giving us some light as to the fact that um, you weren't even aware of the redistricting idea. Sounds like it came from an outside company that was hired. Um, but I would like to point out um, that as long as you keep this on the table, um, it, it'll be dangling over our heads. It'll be, um, as some of the notes said, I think uh, Trevor said it best. Um, this is a huge detriment to our neighborhood, to our values, to our home values, that is. And if we don't uh, say right now as a board that you this won't be considered, um, then I'm afraid that you really are hurting all of our home values at the moment. Um, so I think I can speak for the whole community and I think everyone is in agreement that we'd really like to hear more than just this isn't going to be considered in the short term. What we'd really like to hear is we didn't know that they were going to propose this and we're not going to ever consider it. Um, whether their findings maybe brought some other things to light that we can do that you would consider, that's great. Um, but I feel there's a lot of skirting around the issue right now and just opening up a discussion and saying it won't be discussed for a long time. It's not something we're doing right now. Um, so I just like to put it out there that we'd like to hear more proactively that you will not be redistricting, not just that you will not talk about this right now and it's not being considered tonight. 
Thank you, Stephen. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> Ralph, you're on mute. Yeah, it's Sivan. Sivan, thank you. <laughs> yes. All right, thanks you. And uh, I'll try this once more. P. Hines, I believe, would be the uh, person I ask you to unmute if you're interested in speaking. I believe not. Okay. Um, our next speaker uh, that's got his uh, hands raised is Jordan Sachs. Hey, is it? Thank you for um, explaining the context here. Is there a way that I just having a hard time finding this exact study presentation that everyone's talking about? Is there a way that you can put the link to this in the Zoom call or in the chat so people can read this? I just haven't had a chance to really look at it in detail, so I'd like to, to read it. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Anyone else, Ralph? I will, uh, actually one more. Uh, Tricia McLeod. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Tricia. Okay, so I, uh, I missed the email, uh, but basically um, my wife and I, we live on Arnold Lane, so we add our voices to the note with all the um, people who we read previously. I'm a school teacher and I know we chose to live here and we pay higher taxes to live in Rowayton because we did our research like most parents do who really care about their public school education and we chose, where we, we chose to live on Ardenal Lane because that's what we could afford and still have access to high quality education in Rowayton. So please do not change or redistrict or redraw the zones to eliminate. I'll also say I agreed with the person who said that if you remove the middle class families from Rowayton school, you'll have the very wealthy and then you know, economics, which we already know we have a problem with that in our schools in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Uh, the next, uh, we've, we have a few more people. Um, Jamie Rafferty is next. Hi there. Uh, thank you for reading the letters. Obviously, there's an outstanding number of support to not consider redistricting. Uh, and I second exactly what Savan said. Um, this is a de detriment not only to our home values, but we did choose to live in Rowayton and for the public schools. We all have young children who are coming up in the public schools. And what we do need to hear is that it's not a short term potential item that this is actually not an item at all and not something you are considering. And I do think that it is something we need to nip in the bud now. Um, so thank you for reading all of our letters and voicing everyone's concerns. Um, but I do think that this is something we definitely need to nip in the bud now. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Okay. We have two more people, uh, Lori, Laura Sheehy. Is it right? Great, thank you, Ralph. Can you hear me? We got you, and thanks, great, thanks. And thanks, Colin, for reading everyone's emails and comments, mine included. Um, I'd just like to get a better understanding of if a demographic study like this with really kind of detailed proposed plans is a typical agenda item of a BOE meeting. It seems that this seems a little bit more than a demographic study and like Savan and Jamie said, we wanna make sure that this is taken care of now and we're not revisiting this again in say three, four years when maybe our second and third kid wants to go to Rowayton Elementary or the middle school. So just some more details on this study and really the facts behind it. It didn't seem that the facts really supported what the goal of the study was. Um, so yeah, just if anyone could touch on that, that would be helpful. Thank you, Laura. We will spend most of tonight's meeting talking about those things. So please stick around. 
Okay, our next speaker is Matt Scott. Hey everyone, um, <clears throat> thank you all for, for giving us an opportunity to share our perspective. Um, and first off, just you know, want to underscore um, as a father of you know, three small children, none of whom are, are um, currently enrolled in, in row eight in elementary, um, you know, our, our perspective is very much aligned with all the sentiments that you heard um, uh, from, from, from the letters that were shared. Um, I, I guess the, the two things that just I would like to add to, to kind of the, the dialogue here is number one, um, and perhaps this is this is on me, but um, in terms of the visibility into kind of the, the decision making process, just the agenda items, as as a parent of children that are not in the um, in the school system currently, um, I literally heard about you know kind of this topic of discussion via a text message from my neighbor last night at eleven o'clock. Um, so it, it feels to me that for such a material. Uh, discussion and kind of structurally, economically, sociologically kind of oriented discussion, um, there would be more visibility, more opportunity for public discourse, et cetera. Um, so, so that was just a little unsettling that, you know, the, the, the town or the community had to rally around kind of this, this kind of topic so quickly and so kind of haphazardly. Um, the second thing I'd just like to mention is, you, you know, you've, you've obviously heard from a lot of us as individuals um, and through our own personal experiences, our own personal kind of views. I also think, you know, it is helpful to think about kind of the aggregate impact. Um, a lot of folks have talked about um, the, the equity kind of liability that their, their homes would, would face as a result of this. Um, and just kind of by quick back of the envelope, math. Um, I think we're talking about close to 200 homes. Um, if you think of, call it a 20% um, impact, uh, which is very conservative in terms of kind of um, home value, I, I think overall kind of a, a decision like this would have, um, you know, uh, close to, to $50 million worth of kind of home equity liabilities involved. Um, so I just think it's important to think about kind of the economic liabilities in aggregate. Um, it's, it's um, you know, difficult to kind of parse the, the individual experiences versus the aggregate, but, but I think that's something that's important for, for all folks to, to consider as well. Thank you so much, Matt. Our next speakers are Amy and Raul. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to address the board um, and thank you for reading our comments. We did want to react to the news that was presented here on this call today uh, in terms of this solely being a study, but we all understand that a study is commissioned with a resulting action and outcome in mind and when those studies are commissioned, there's parameters set, right? So we ask that you change the assumptions for future iterations of the scenario planning, whereby you remove our neighborhood from rezoning so that as a future consideration, your study is accurate for the action and outcomes that you're trying to achieve um, and taking into consideration the strong voice of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Raul. Our next speaker is Ileana Zuniga. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ileana Zuniga. I am a resident of Silvermine. And I just wanted to share something quick. Uh, I hear a lot of fear on the voices and on the emails of parents in Rowayton, uh, fear of uh, redistricting, fear of their schools being you know, the education of their kids being heard or the value of their homes being damaged. I was very lucky to have my kids in Silvermine Elementary. As many of you know, this is a magnet school that has kids from all over the district. And I can just tell you how event, what an amazing enrichment um, experience it was for my children to be able to be in that school, having the ability to make friends and meet kids from all over Norwalk. So as a homeowner, I understand some of these fears, but I also welcome you to be open-minded. I don't know if this is gonna happen or not, but all I can tell you is that our experiences, we chose to live in Silvermine, it's a wonderful neighborhood, 
but the school and the kids that are in this in this school and the families, the diversity of the families make it even more beautiful. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Eliana. And our last speaker is Lauren and Connor Soden. Uh, thank you, Colin, for reading the, uh, the letters and alleviating, alleviating our concerns. Um, I, I think uh, home value is obviously of utmost concern, but let's not lose sight of the children and the fact that uh, this could seriously impact. I mean, something we take very lightly could seriously impact the um, developmental and well-being of our kids. Uh, I think uh, school was the only um, uh, thing of stability and permanence, I think, in our children's lives over the last year. So let's certainly be mindful of that and, and um, you know, diminution of, of home values and paying high taxes and all that is obviously very important. But, you know, I think of, of utmost importance is like the well-being of our children. And we chose Rowayton because the, not only the school system is great, but also because the, the parents are very involved equally. And it, it really, in truth, is a partnership between the school system, the teachers, and the involvement of the students and we of the parents. And we all know that that's a very integral part of the uh, child's development. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren and Connor. And I believe that's it for public comments. I, I see no other hands up. Thank okay. you. Hey, um, well, I just wanna say again, thank you to everyone for joining us, for letting your, your voices be heard. Um, I hope you stick around and, and, and uh, watch with us. The board, by the way, is seeing this demographer, demographer's report for the first time along with you. So please watch along with us. And, and please know that, you know, we are your board of education. We are not here to, to do anything that we think will, will be harmful to our learning community, right? We're gonna do it, we're, we're, we're here to work in concert with you and, and we really, really appreciate uh, your advocacy, your involvement. Um, we hope you hope you stick around. And, and you know, I, I I do again hope that this is a little bit reassuring. I, I sometimes things somebody says something on social media and it takes off like wildfire, and people get very um, you know frustrated and, and upset. But um, but we're glad you're here tonight uh, to watch this demographic report with us. Um, we generally generally don't respond to individual uh, public comments. Um, However, in deference to my predecessor as chair, Sarah Lemieux, I, I, I did want to give you a chance if you wanted to say something very brief. I just wanted to say, uh, not as a response to any comment in particular, but just, and I'm sure that none of the parents who spoke tonight meant to imply this in any way, but I've been in all of our elementary schools in the district, and they're all wonderful, beautiful, amazing learning communities with amazing teachers and engaged parents and wonderful administrators and programming. So I think sometimes when you listen to just one school community, it, it can, or, you know, when you're focused on your own school community, it can uh, maybe, you might not see how, how beautiful the rest of the district is. That's all. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and uh, before we move on to the superintendent's report and we, where we'll hear much more about this uh, this report, I do want to say a big shout out. We got so many comments and I wanted to make sure that everybody felt heard. I am so grateful to Maura Ferrotelli for helping me um, organize all these comments. Um, there were a lot and I, I really should appreciate her effort uh, tonight. Thank you, Maura. Dr. Astoria, I'm going to kick, take it over to you for the superintendent's report. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good evening, everyone. I wanna start off the, the evening by um, holding a moment of silence. We lost um, one of our students. Her name was Mary um, Ellen Cerrone. Um, and I, she was a student uh, originally at Row Aiton and then um, was uh, last uh, a student at PONUS. So, I think it's important um, when we lo lose such a precious angel that we take a moment as a community to remember her. She was she had an enormous impact in her school community and brought a lot of smiles to her peers as well as those that supported her throughout the years. Um, so if we can hold a moment of silence.
Thank you. So um, to start with the, super, uh, with the superintendent report today, before we go into the dem um, demographers um, study, I want to take a moment just to give um, the community a quick refresher around the state guide guidelines around um, safety and um, ensuring the, the well-being and health of our students. I know that we are at a point um, in the pandemic that we are exhausted about um, the measures and metrics we need to follow to ensure the safety and well-being of our students. But I can po positively report that we're transitioning from a red zone um, currently to an orange zone. And a lot of that has to do one with our concerted effort in ensuring that our staff as well as our students are vaccinated, but also because we have continued to be very, very diligent in the, in the metrics that we've put in place to ensure the safety and well-being of our students. And I know there's been a lot of dialogue around um, the prom and graduation and other activities. And um, there's a lot of preconceived Assumptions, notions and assumptions around how decisions are made. And one of the things that I want to reassure the public that this is not a, a one person um, decision process. We have a team of folks um, that utilize science to make informed decisions of how to most effectively uh, provide students with great learning um, experiences, but also great memories, especially for our seniors that are gonna be transitioning um, out of our system and into either career pathways, college, and whatever um, path that they have chosen to transition to. Um, so I've invited um, uh, our amazing Joanne Malinowski, who has been in, an incredible uh, partner in, in the thinking and processes that we put in place uh, alongside our Department of Health, who has been a very active partner in supporting us as we think through um, the best mitigating parameters that we have to put in place to ensure the well-being of our students. And I know she brought someone uh, uh, in addition um, that has been another amazing asset, um, but I'm gonna have her introduce her partner and um, provide you just kind of a brief update and scope of where we are with the state, especially because the governor has put out releases that are overarching, but that don't necessarily apply to the schools. And we normally, when the governor is providing overarching guidance for the state at large, we then get separate guidance in terms of what are the mitigating factors that we have to take into account within schools. And they're not always the same. And I know that a lot of that has created confusion. So I think it, it's important to just take a brief moment to clarify some of the misunderstanding and um, just help us get through the, hopefully the last thread of this pandemic and ensure that our, all of our students are safe. So I'll turn it over to you, John. Thank you, Dr. Estrella. Um, what I'd like to start out by saying is we're on a downturn turn, and I'm very happy about that. My compadre is Alyssa Eratopoulos that has been um, with me every step of the way at School Health Services along with the other nurses. We do all the contact tracing um, along with our team. But what I wanna really speak to is the fact that we unilaterally do not make these decisions ourselves. This is not Norwalk Public Schools that's deciding what you can and cannot do. This comes from the CDC, the Department of Public Health, and the Connecticut State Department of Education. Um, we were on a call with our high school people that regarding proms and graduations, and we actually went to the state and we spoke to Tom St. Louis, and uh, he's an epidemiologist for the state of Connecticut, and he got back to us, and I'm going to read you verbatim. Um, we were looking, people are wondering why we can't be unmasked, we can't be, you know, less than six feet apart. Uh, nothing has changed for schools. Business venues are a different guidance. We don't get into that at all. Schools have our congregate setting. Okay, so I'm going to read what he said. The guidance is still six foot distancing. Masking should be in place for all in attendance, including proms and graduations, etc. This is stated in the graduation guidance. Our advice to schools is to not to fundamentally change operating procedures through the end of the school year 
to protect in-person learning to the extent possible. And that's why we have all these mitigating measures in place. And I'd like to say that it's working. We work very close with our wonderful health department and Dr. Norman Weinberger, our medical advisor. We unilaterally do not make these decisions. This comes from the science. So um, I, I just want you to understand that we're not trying to keep people apart. Uh, we do the contact tracing. And if we have a prom that has 200 kids at that prom, and it's a week before graduation and you have a positive case, we cannot trace that. Therefore, the entire prom, anybody who attended that's not fully vaccinated or had COVID within the last 90 days won't be able to go to graduation. So, I mean, we look at all of this stuff coming down the pike and we're trying to keep people safe. And I think um, we're working very hard at it, seven days a week, 365 days a year, we've been on. Um, the only days we actually had our computers off was Christmas Day, New Year's Day, and Thanksgiving Day. That's it. And Missy um, is, uh, celebrates Greek Orthodox Easter, and she works Sunday. So just so you know, we are on it. We're trying to keep people safe, and we are following the guidance to the letter. And it's working. We have a downturn right now. So let's keep it going, and maybe summer our summer school will be a little bit more interactive. I certainly hope so. And I'm really hopeful for the fall. Get vaccinated. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and as, as we continue to get more information and we uh, acquire um, better data in terms of, um, when I say better data, not necessarily that the data we're getting are, is not informative, but that the data con starts continuing to show that positive trend. Um, we can continue then to revisit the possibility of moving forward with the transition plan of having um, more students in person than we currently um, have. But when we do that, we want to make sure that we are making um, decisions that are going to serve the best interests and, and welfare of our kids. So thank you, um, Joanne and, and team, for providing us the opportunity to just um, update our community around that. So in terms of the presentation today, one of the things that um, we wanted to do as part of the planning for the new um, strategic framework, we wanted to make sure that we had an understanding as we immerse in the conversations around the facility study, looking at the state of our facilities, which we had the opportunity to present um, earlier a few weeks ago, we wanted to also have um, a closer look in terms of enrollment numbers and patterns that might influence um, what we need in terms of facilities uh, within the district. Originally, the plan was to um, immerse this presentation as part of the workshop, but understanding um, bandwidth, especially because a lot of this uh, is happening in a remote setting, we knew that it was going to be um, a little bit of an overload because um, the facilities presentation took an extensive amount of time. And this presentation is also very robust. So um, in conversation with the board, we decided to split the conversation, the presentation. So ideally, this demographic study will normally happen during a workshop session, which would um, allow for um, conversation and then further analysis. So our goal today is to initiate a dialogue around demographics, also take a look at um, South Norwalk and the potential proposed um, new school in connection to CMS and um, their new site and talk about um, the current enrollment patterns, the current needs um, within the next few years in terms of um, student enrollment but also look at the impact that um, a soft Norwalk school will have in terms of enrollment numbers across the district. The scenarios that um, were created uh, were designed for uh, the board to have an opportunity to engage in a dialogue uh, and look at what the what ifs if, um, within the district based on enrollment numbers and how they will shift as a result of the new school um, being created. And additionally, the expansion of uh, the potential expansion of CMS middle school seats as well. It also looked at different scenarios that encompassed um, the two schools being element, um, solely elementary schools and as well as other potential 
um, scenarios that the board could utilize as talking points and um, have further dialogue and conversation because it's important for us to um, understand the impact that um, creating a school and a, a, a um, attendance zone for the South Norwegian students will have in, in terms of enrollment numbers across the district. Because currently our D99 students are um, dispersed throughout the school, all of the elementary schools within the district. And that in itself, if we create a attendance zone will have an impact in the enrollment numbers um, across, this, uh, across the system. So part of the scenario design was intended to develop dialogue, to acquire feedback, and to um, engage in a informed decision-making process as we continue to talk about the, the South Norwalk School and um, the, the growth of the um, Columbus Middle School seats and, and discussing how enrollment trends at the middle school level are also impacted and influenced by some of this work. So uh, unfortunately, when we present um, the PowerPoint in advance, it creates a lot of um, conversation because it, it doesn't come with the dialogue that is intended to take place during um, the board conversation. So, you know, I, I'm sorry that things took such a, a, a such a spin, but I hope that today as um, Mr. Mike Zuba speaks to um, the, the, in, the current enrollment numbers, the trends, and the intended dialogue that we're hoping to immerse the board in, um, it will help demystify some of the um, misconceptions that have been developed um, what, after the, the actual presentation was posted, but also will solicit productive, positive conversations. It's not about agreeing or disagreeing, it's more about collecting feedback for us to, to better understand the community's needs, thinking and perspective that will help us make informed decisions as we continue to move forward and plan and, and, and take into consideration enrollment trends and patterns, um, either impacted by new facility facilities being built or, or um, shifting in population and demographics across the district. So it, it just allows us to have data points of conversation so that the board can make informed decisions based on not only community feedback, but also um, the feedback of individual um, communities, but also the feedback of, of the whole district at large. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Mr. Su um, Suba to um, present with, to us the demographic study and um, immerse the board in, in hopefully a very uh, productive dialogue around um, the scenarios that um, have been articulated in the presentation today. Thank you, Dr. Estrella, and um, everybody bear with me for a minute. It's um, as I get the uh, screen share going. Well, I'm pleased to be here tonight to present um, what I think are some exciting demographics and some options to help kind of inform the demographic side for school facility planning. It's unfortunate that as Dr. Estrella said, some of this goes out without context, but um, bear with me throughout. I'm gonna start with the big picture enrollment and demographics and what's been happening and then work down into the scenario planning. And I know there was a question on, is this pretty typical of getting into you know, different options? Um, and they really are just concepts of looking at what it would take to be able to um, populate different schools, um, what some of the moving parts are. Um, and these are just really what ifs that we're looking at right now. So. Um, with that, I'll, I'll jump right into the overall enrollment projections. Um, it's something that we've been doing for Norwalk Public Schools since 2014. Um, it's been our first pandemic and projecting through that. Um, so last year when we put our enrollment projections together, um, we weren't foreseeing um, you know, what, what happened you know, a year later really as we went from 19 to 20 and then 20 into 21 now. Um, but what we were able to do is get data points, not only from our other client communities throughout the Northeast, but also um, through the uh, State Board of Ed, um, taking a look at what's happened in order to be able to best project going forward. So what we're seeing is really a disconnect between um, what our prior projections were and what this year's are, really due to the pandemic and really in the lower elementary 
um, level grades where um, we're seeing uh, really parents um, opting, especially last summer into the early fall to not send their children um, into kindergarten. And, and we saw that with some reduced levels of kindergarten in Norwalk, as well as in other districts. Um, but overall, we're still seeing um, the enrollment projection trend um, moving upward um, with this being just a real blip that um, unfortunately stalled immigration, stalled a lot of things um, that typically drives enrollment in a given community. What we were able to get through data through the State Department of Education, um, overall, we're seeing um, many different many districts were di um, impacted differently, but there are a lot of common trends and those are really those lower grade levels, pre-K um, decline across the board, um, especially in those Alliance districts. Kindergarten enrollment fell 12% statewide um, from 1920 and it wasn't due to corresponding births, it was really due to parents you know, opting out or homeschool or having delayed entry. Um, we see that going forward as having much larger kindergarten classes for the coming school year across um, Connecticut and many of our clients throughout the Northeast. When we began looking at Norwalk in comparison to some of their other Derg H districts in the state of Connecticut, um, when we look at the total enrollment change due to the pandemic, we saw that Norwalk fared fairly well. Um, they were rather resilient compared to some other um, some other communities that saw some greater losses. Um, when we looked at the kindergarten enrollment change um, from 1920 to 2021, um, Norwalk was at about 10.5%, um, similar to some other communities and not nearly as impacted as say Bridgeport and Stanford were um, over that same period of time. Um, so that provided us some you know, greater, bigger picture of what those larger trends are, not only you know, throughout the state, but um, throughout many of our communities. One of the data points that we've been tracking for a number of years in Norwalk is the historic minority percentage. And this has impacts on things like the state racial balance law and, and how you zone schools or how you craft choice and magnet programming. Um, since our data goes back to about 2007, 2008, um, at that time it was 59% minority. Um, it has now risen to 74% officially. And what our unofficial number using the October 1st enrollment is at 75%. There should be a report from the State Board of Ed making that number official in the next couple of weeks. Um, but ultimately, um, this has an impact on um, state racial balance because the um, state mandates that each school has to have light grades grouped at no greater than 25% deviation from the district wide average. And that then pushes that upper limit to above 25%. And then once you reach 75%, um, the lower limit then becomes 25%. So as we talk about attendance zone and whether it's through um, traditional neighborhood schools or it's through choice and magnet programming, um, what a lot of the results of some of the redistricting in the past that we'll show later on um, were really the reaction to um, some of these state um, diversity and racial balance laws that were put on the books dating back 50 and 60 years or so. So that does have important context about what we're talking about. Um, so tracking student immigration over the last um, five or six years in Norwalk, um, we had last year in 1920 was the largest year for students new to the district. And the way that we perform this analysis is that we track state IDs and look for that student with the same state ID in any prior years to Norwalk or if they were never there before, then we presume they're new to the district. And we do that at the various grade levels in order to be able to fine tune our enrollment projection models. Um, what you'll see in 2021 is just a big drop off in student immigration. Um, we've seen this drop off overall throughout the state, many of our client communities, um, just in response to the pandemic. Um, but prior to that, um, Norwalk was on the increase sands for a small blip in 18 and 19. Um, the major part of that is really the geographic component. Um, so going through that same analysis, but tying in a student's address to it, we were able to create some hotspot maps to look at the greatest density of new to district students throughout um, Norwalk. And it's no surprise that um, many of them are occurring in the downtown and South Norwalk neighborhood, as well as along um, the Route 7 corridor. Um, and as you have new students coming, not only um, for the first of the year, but mid-year, um, that's where you see then enrollment fluctuations and changes in class size and staffing around that. So it's great to be able to get a handle on this, not only from a, an operational standpoint, but also for a school facility standpoint. Um, we've also been tracking the uh, multi 
lingual learners, um, the trends in that. Um, and that had been on the increase up until 1920. Um, in 2021, um, we've seen that number come down some. And it's my understanding that that's from a number of students being able to reach a proficiency level and test out. So kudos to the district there. Um, this provides us good insight of what the different needs are. And this is our, our step back looking at the big picture of um, when you're facility planning, if you have students with different language needs, um, you're gonna have different classroom space requirements to be able to accommodate those. Um, so this is where we take a step back and look at the big picture district-wide, but this is where we begin combining the two data sets of not only new to district students, so those that have um, you know, arrived recently there that weren't there in prior years, but also looking at those that also have some language needs. And then we create the similar hotspot map to help us really pinpoint on where are some of those areas that are going to have the turnover, going to have um, the need for space and the need for programs to be able to help accommodate that. And uh, what we're seeing is in really you know, the, the greatest area of need is within the downtown in South Norwalk, as well as um, some of the area and some of the neighborhoods alongside Route 1 and then going up the Route 7 corridor. So building upon some of the enrollment information that we talked about, we also did a full analysis of housing data, housing starts and housing sales. Um, we have a rolling tally that we keep um, from year to year um, and be able to update that as well as the larger birth trends and economic trends in order to create um, enrollment projections. Um, the state requires that we use a cohort survival method. Um, it's a great methodology when you have a community that's um, growing or shrinking or you have pretty steady rates because it really is predicated on the historic past as a good proxy for what's going to happen in the near future. Um, where we begin to modify our enrollment projections is where we begin seeing um, a lot of housing starts or housing growth within a community. Um, so working with the planning department, um, we request the year, uh, list every year of what are those new projects that have are either in the planning stage, approval stage, or construction stage. We get a breakdown of um, the type of units, the number of bedrooms, and we look to see whether or not that fits what the pattern was. And if it doesn't fit, um, we go through the process of creating these external multipliers and we add those into the um, enrollment projection forecast to ensure that we're capturing and getting ahead of um, what the housing conditions are within the community and where housing is going where you otherwise would not have captured those. So similar to what we've been doing in the past in Norwalk and, and other districts is really looking at three different projection models. Um, having gone through um, doing demographics work through the Great Recession and the housing boom before that and now our pandemic, um, it's always important, especially when you're facility planning, to be able to prepare a low, medium, and high model that um, begin to be get driven by slightly different assumptions. Um, so typically in enrollment projections, your first five years are always your most accurate, and then you use the data points in order to be able to model forward what the next five to 10 years look like. Um, and some of that relies on students that are already in the seats and they matriculate through the system, but some of that also relies on making some assumptions along um, housing sales, um, BERTs going forward. Um, so this is a model that we've been using for about six years with good results. Um, we've created the three different lines. Um, our top line is our high model. This assumes, and the big drivers for these three models are really when immigration returns. So this assumes um, an immediate return to um, immigration into Norwalk. Um, this also has the current housing trends that we've been experiencing, those elevated levels continuing going forward. Um, whereas the medium model assumes a much slower or slightly slower return to the historic immigration levels. Um, we have it lagging at two to three years um, in order to be able to get to that recent peak that you experienced um, and continuing of the same housing trends, but not as rapid changes. It's looking at more of, uh, of price points increasing, um, supply dwindling and creating a much tighter market overall. And then the low model assumes that um, immigration lags, housing activity slows down considerably. Um, we don't see that as a likely outcome. Um, for the purposes of the facility planning, we're really looking at that uh, medium model, but that is also in really good agreement with that higher model. So we have really um, two boundary lines to be able to test um, the facility planning against. So this is what the next 10-year forecast for um, Norwalk Public Schools looks like. 
So anywhere from really the midpoint on the chart represents, and hopefully it's clear for those that are viewing from home, represents the historic enrollment um, over, since really 2010 um, to the current school year. You could see where Norwalk was on this really slow but steady increase. And then we, as I discussed earlier, we have this little bit of a dip. That dip is largely um, driven by those lower elementary grades. Um, but overall, we're seeing that dip then met with a rebound as those students begin returning into the system with a larger kindergarten class for next year. Um, and then enrollment really growing from 11,808 upwards to 12,418 overall. When we look at the blue bar, which represents the K-5 enrollment, um, we're looking at much lower enrollment growth there within that K-5 group. Um, really a lot of stability where for a large portion of the projection horizon, there's going to be about um, 5,080 to 5,050 or so um, students there in the last five years. Um, the enrollment in the more mustard colored bar um, represents that of grade six through eight. Um, we're looking at fairly stable enrollment there. There will be a little bit of a dip down to 2,500 or so students in 26, 27, but followed by a rebound getting you back to about where you are today. Um, so some pretty stable enrollment there as well. And then in the green bar represents the high school and that's showing an enrollment increase as some of these uh, larger class cohorts matriculate through um, the school system and end up in high school over the next 10 years where enrollment's projected to grow from the 3851 based on the October 1st upwards to 4,233. Um, in the last part of our projection horizon. And one of the other factors is the pre-K, which is the tiniest of tiny bars along the bottom, which historically you've been about 250 odd pre-K seats um, over the last several years. This year, we saw a little bit of a pandemic dip, um, but looking at the master planning and the strategic plan initiative with the desire to be able to grow more um, pre-K seats at the elementary schools over the next 10 years, um, the pre-K number was adjusted to be able to reflect that of the master plan um, with pre-K levels looking at about 500 students going out in 29 and 30. So taking that baseline demographic and really be focused on the district wide, especially as we're looking at doing some conceptual planning, working hand in hand with the master plan at the elementary level. So part of the charge of, of what we were tasked with looking at um, was really you know the three main objectives of being able to enhance equity for the South Norwalk students. Um, as you'll see later on, and I know Dr. Estrella mentioned, um, there's quite a number of students there um, that are um, students that don't have a home district or they're satellited out to other elementary schools throughout the Norwalk community. Um, we want to be able to improve community and family access to neighborhood schools and enhance the opportunities and access um, overall for pre-K. Um, looking at several strategies, and you know, these are five that um, we looked at as part of our study, but there's also other others that we're suggesting along the way. Um, it looks at eliminating the unassigned attendance areas that are sprinkled throughout South Norwalk, eliminate the satellite attendance areas in South Norwalk neighborhood, provide those same educational options within South Norwalk neighborhood, and achieve enrollment balances and balance at the major grade grouping levels. So looking at a way to be able to balance enrollment out throughout the schools and provide um, the available seats for pre-K opportunities at every elementary school. Mr. So Sue, for, before you, oh. go ahead. Before we go into the next um, phase of the presentation, I just wanted to take a, a pause to make sure if the board, uh, if any board members had any questions about enrollment trends and numbers, um, just because I want to make sure that they have an opportunity in between each section to Definitely. question. Um, currently, what is the enrollment in the unassigned attendance zones now? Um, just to help put in perspective uh, where we are. I'm going to have to get back to you on the exact number in the unattended un in the unassigned attendance zone now. I don't have that at my fingertips. I'm sorry. Uh, this is Steve. If I can ask, um, you mentioned that Norwalk had a slightly smaller um, attendance dip 
than some of our uh, DRGs, district representative groups like Stanford and Bridgeport. Uh, I know you're not necessarily doing a demographic study of those districts, but does that imply that they will have a higher rebound in the next year or two? It, without having studied them, I, I wouldn't imply that they will have a higher rebound. Um, there could have been some other factors there. I do know um, when we looked at some other communities, we did see some greater losses depending on the community to private schools where some of that rather than going and it really depended on the model that the districts were opening in, whether it was um, a hybrid, a full remote or in person, we saw different responses. So I wouldn't be able to speak to um, you know, what may happen there, um, but really it was um, community by community. Um, and we did see some that had a higher um, prevalence of those opting for private kindergarten rather than going for public kindergarten than that had happened in the past. Um, and just to get a quick follow up, um, I wonder if you could just talk briefly about the way that you analyze housing starts, as you mentioned, um, because, you know, it, it, particularly here in Newark, we hear a lot of talk about um, apartments being built and uh, new housing being built, um, yet we see our uh, projected uh, um, enrollment not particularly exploding over the next 10 or so years. So. Uh, you know, can you just give a brief explanation of how you uh, interpret those numbers? Yeah, so the main things we look at for housing starts, um, and it's different, what we're seeing housing now with it much more geared towards the smaller mixed use multifamily um, style developments. A lot, a lot of the units, um, especially those in Norwalk, don't have high bedroom counts, so they tend not to generate school age children. We're talking a majority of the units um, are a single, you know, one bedroom, um, a very, very few two bedroom or, or three bedroom. Um, there's a lot of studio apartments. So as you look at those housing starts, even though the number is, is, is rather high, they're really geared towards um, those that are either um, haven't started a family yet. Um, you know, the, the young workers, the workforce, as well as those that may be looking to downsize. Um, they're not what was built in the past where um, it was very heavy on three bedroom units, um, those that were geared towards family housing. Um, so that's why you're not seeing a tremendous amount of students generated um, from those type of units. And it's not just in Norwalk, it's across many communities where um, you're developing those type of units. They just um, don't generate a lot of school age children. Uh, Mike? Yep. Can I just say one thing that has been kind of the city's line, what you just said, and, and obviously they are smaller units, but we're still generating kids from these places and even head of the Harbor, um, you know, which was not supposed to have any kids and the developer got into an argument with me, you know, we looked into it. I think maybe six kids were coming from those 40 units, even though most of them are one bedrooms, yeah. you know, there, there is some generation and even, at um, Ironbound, uh, which are, are quite small. Well, we only got one student there, but it was an outplaced SPED student costing us $80,000 a year. So they do generate some sub students, but obviously that's why it's not surging because they are on the smaller side. Yeah, the, the multiplier is very low. It's not what you would see in a traditional single family neighborhood home. Um, they do generate, you are correct, they do generate students, but it's not to the same level. We've gone through the analysis where um, we've, we have the student enrollment database address match. We, we are able to generate multipliers that are specific to Norwalk, looking at your historic um, developments as well as what has come online over the last 10 years. Um, and then use that as a basis for what we're gonna see um, with new students going forward. Um, what we are seeing though is, you know, with where we may see 200, units, um, 11 students coming out of their in total spread across now 13 grades. So, um, you know, one student per grade coming out of a major housing development, it, in my opinion, I don't consider that a tremendous generation of, of, of school age children, not like we saw in the past. Makes sense. Thanks. A good question.
Any other questions on the enrollment projections so far? I think we can continue, Mike, thanks. Oh, thank you. And I think what I could do too, as I kind of walk through these, um, I'll get through them and then I'm, I have slide numbers on everyone. I know it's a lot of information, but I wanna be sure to be able to get back to everybody on questions on every one of these. Um, so we could be able to talk through them and everybody's clear on what they are and what they aren't and why we're going through this process. And I'll, I'll be able to fill everybody in exactly on that. Um, so as we went through these um, sort of scenario planning, we, in order to be able to understand what the demographic need is within an area, you have to begin sort of looking at, you know, what is the area itself? And you go through this mental mapping of defining geographies and looking at um, what are these attendance zones, what has been done in the past, and, and what would be necessary going forward if you're going to be able to meet um, some of the objectives that we were charged with as part of the study. So um, we started with the existing school attendance zones as the starting point across the board. Um, we did go back to the 1920 um, student enrollment, not the most recent enrollment. And you know what we're representing tonight are just enrollment snapshots. So they're not projections going forward. It's not looking at what it would look like. It's not refined and saying that over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna have this many students. We, we wanted to pick an enrollment year that best represented Norwalk to be able to test these different scenarios for conversation starters. 2021 was clearly impacted, especially at the elementary level by the pandemic. Um, so we went back to that prior number. Um, working hand in hand with the master planning team, DLR and Newman, um, we were able to um, get a good understanding of what target capacity should be for these elementary schools and these target capacities include all of the analysis and all the great work that they discussed at the meeting a few weeks ago to be able to move learning forward, to be able to align it with sort of what that vision is. Um, so our target capacities reflect that master planning work. Um, what we then do is look at um, where we have a lot of these choice and magnet programs um, that have been in place for a while. We wanna hold those students harmless in order to be able to accurately represent those going forward knowing that you know, those aren't likely to go away. Um, where we did not make those adjustments was within the South Norwalk neighborhood. Um, there was just so much outplacement there. We were not able to get a good feel um, for what that neighborhood demographic looked like without being able to sort of just take the students that reside there and look at what it would take if they had a neighborhood option, who would go there, what would that look like? Um, because there's just so much outplacement within that area. So working with the master planning team and the administration, this really was a, a major iterative scenario. We went through various changes in um, school size, number of classrooms, number of sections per grade, um, changes just to geography, um, really looking at being able to sort of fine tune and create a concept that was um, a different enough to be able to have discussion. So I don't intend any one of these to be able to be taken off the shelf. And this isn't a redistricting process. I've done enough of those. This is a school facility planning process. Um, my intent tonight is to be able to provide four different or three different scenarios um, for the Board of Ed um, to have some rich dialogue on. Um, they have changes not only to the geographies, but they also have changes um, to the number of sections per grade, whether it's a K-5 or a K-8 magnet. Um, and we, need, we needed to be able to test that seat count to see what the overall utilization would look like, because that's one of the parameters that um, the State Office of School Construction Grants is gonna ask the district to say, hey, well, you're looking at building, um, how many seats, what's your utilization, what does this do for the other schools? So in order to be able to answer those questions, we had to go through um, this level of due diligence or concept planning, as I call it, to ensure that Norwalk, if this were to go forward, um, was it would be aligned to be able to have a successful um, school construction grant application. So I went a little bit out of order, um, even though I numbered them four, five, and six. In looking at sort of how they laid out, I thought for conversation, let's focus on option six or scenario six for the first part of the discussion, because this really just looked at two K-5 schools. Um, as you'll see in the latter scenarios, um, we then began looking at K-8 for the magnet theme school, um, look, and then look at different size for the middle school and uh, the elementary school components. Um, so this is really looking at the smallest infusion of seats. 
at just over 700 and I believe it's 25, 26 um, new seats within the South Norwalk neighborhood. Um, we're also modeling it with Lower Ponus coming online um, in the next couple of years and being able to look at creating those cohesive um, neighborhood districts um, within the neighborhood and then looking at what it means for considerations to have dialogue on feeder patterns as well as um, reserving space over the over the next few years to be able to have pre-k designated classrooms to be able to meet the uh, meet the objectives of the district to be able to have those offerings at all of the elementary schools so as we just Thus, these are conceptual zones just to be able to test the demographic side of the school facility planning. I'm not going to get spend a lot of time going through street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood, other than noting that you have neighborhood schools. You're also been transitioning towards choice and magnet programming. Um, the less you rely on neighborhood school boundaries and the more options you have for choice and magnet programming, the better you are in a position to be able to manage enrollment through um, student selection of, of where they wanna go programmatically. So scenario six mirrored scenario five, which we'll talk about. Um, it did have a lot of changes overall. Um, a lot of those changes were really for the establishment of this area shown in pink is where I'm gonna focus. Um, and this is really what we're defining based on the number of seats we're allotted here as the South Norwalk neighborhood. Um, it definitely bears having a discussion on the existing districts within this neighborhood, especially for those if you may not be familiar. Um, for as long as I've been assisting Norwalk with their demographics, and I know from hearing from um, um, longtime staff that it's been that way for a number of years, um, this is what the Nor South Norwalk neighborhood looks like. Um, so I colored this area in gray, um, and it really isn't, it, it's, it's called the 99 or the unassigned area. I know the question came up on how many students are there and I will gladly get back on that. But basically students residing within this swath and this swath, um, you know, re their school placement is based on administrative policy of, you know, where there's space, where there's availability. Um, there isn't a lot of continuity of every student that lives in this gray area is gonna get placed in the exact same school to be able to have some, some larger peer groups to have some continuity with peer groups from neighbors and friends. Um, what also is really evident is as you begin to see these various sort of Easter egg colors where um, we have, you know, this blue satellite area that goes well north to Cranberry, as well as the purple satellite area that um, moves students up into the um, east to um, north into the east of Tracy, as well as um, an attendance, a satellite attendance zone for Silvermine. Um, a satellite attendance zone for Naramake, a satellite attendance zone for Lower Ponus, as well as um, in the root beer color down here, Kendall. So within this small compact area, you have very, you have many pathways um, where students of this neighborhood are um, then um, placed for their elementary school education. Um, so what we were looking to be able to do was to create a cohesive district that eliminated the unassigned areas eliminated the various satellite pathways, um, but also provided some continuity and enough seat count um, to be able to serve the children within that neighborhood. Um, so based on our 1920 data um, within the area defined by the uh, pink color, we have 661 K-5 students um, residing in there and 341 6-8 um, students. So. Um, we were looking at being able to size this attendance zone accordingly with the idea that it would have this um, neighborhood component. So the K-5 elementary school component of 414 seats, um, which roughly equates to three sections per grade, as well as a K-5 magnet school component of 312 um, seats or um, roughly two sections per grade there in order to be able to fit and serve that demographic need. When we looked at what the overall holistic view of the entire complement of elementary um, schools looked like as part of this, um, we noted with the infusion of those 726 seats shown on the bottom here, um, the district overall stands at about 88% utilization. So um, definitely right around the mark that the state would be looking at, um, but also noting that you know there is some discrepancies there overall of being able to drive students in some of the areas that aren't growing 
um, as much or have not or have seen some enrollment decline. Um, but overall, what it tells us is that as part of this, the K-5 elementary school supports a neighborhood population of 400 students. Um, for the Columbus Magnet, what we wanted to be able to do there was to be able to allow some space. If it is a magnet program, there could be this neighborhood preference zone is what we're um, proposing um, for discussion, but also being able to have students then that may not be in that neighborhood preference zone, have enough seats there for them to be able to participate in the magnet program and have a movement of students um, down into that neighborhood. Um, what this also does from additional seats there at the elementary level would be able to uh, have enough space should there be future growth so you can work that magnet programming or that choice programming hand in hand with the future growth to ensure that um, this level would ultimately be operating at about 100 percent utilization from year to year because it would be reliant on choice placement. So for the middle school boundaries, we've also created this conceptual zone of looking at um, if it, we still had the same pink area, um, what would that do from the middle school standpoint and under option six or scenario six, um, this does not have a six, eight component overall. So these are just the two K-5 schools and looking at what the current enrollment is there and looking at what the target capacity based on the master planning study it puts the district at about 99% um, utilization overall um, with having to accommodate those 230 uh, students that reside in that area. So that begs the question for you know, tonight's discussion is, there's numerous ways to be able to get there. Um, and you know, would one of those ways for the middle school be um, creating sort of a satellite or a choice programming to be able to utilize the existing space at the remaining middle schools um, or is there, you know, some better options there to be able to pathway students um, into those programs there um, because it provides that neighborhood continuity and programming from K-5, but, you know, from, all, from what our charge was, um, the scenario six may have fallen a little bit short by not providing any middle school seats going forward. And if you paid attention to my middle school projection, you'll see that um, the middle school enrollments for those six, eight grade levels are going to be fairly stable over the next decade, right in that 2600 mark. So, um, you know, they would be really operating at that target capacity overall. So um, placement for those students, if this option were to go forward, um, would be important to be able to get input on to be able to enshrine it as part of the master planning process. The next scenario is scenario four, and this one um, provides a little bit greater space. Um, it has a lot of the same assumptions as scenario six. However, what we are doing with this one is we're also providing six, eight seats. Um, so scenario six didn't have a middle school component as part of the new Columbus magnet. Um, this scenario four provides that component at two sections per grade from kindergarten all the way up through eighth grade. So just a little bit of a different spin on it. And with this, with this option, we had a little bit greater movement of students overall when we went through this conceptual placement. And this really relies on just neighborhood zoning, attended zone zoning. Um, what, what our options here are silent to um, are any of the future programs that are gonna really drive choice, um, provide richer options for those students that may wanna opt out or opt into a new school. Um, so this had a fairly large impact in order to bring this option online. Um, based on the attendance zones for scenario four, you'll see that we have a reduction in our overall K-5 seat count. So we have some shrinking of the neighborhood attendance zone as shown in the pink line once again. In order to be able to provide continuity in seats and students um, with access to schools that are closer by, um, this option looked at bringing over the neighboring Brookside neighborhood um, across um, over into the South Norwalk neighborhood as the next most proximate school there. Um, so really we undid a lot of the satellite and the um, unassigned zones and we used space that was proximate in order to be able to accommodate that. In order to be able to gain that space, um, we had to have some fairly large redistricting impacts to be able to leverage and utilize all the existing seats um, without building those seats um, in South Norwalk 
it was necessary to be able to better balance enrollment across all the remaining elementary schools to better utilize those seats. So under this smaller K-5 area, we have 534 K-5 students and 291 6-8 students. So when we look at our enrollment snapshot here, I'm still following along with the magnet school. It just can't be solely based on neighborhood preference. Um, we've buffered it with about 15% of seats that would be available um, to accommodate students outside of South Norwalk. Um, the South Norwalk Elementary School can be loaded right around 300 students. So um, it has the ability to be able to accommodate um, that school of 312 students overall. Um, and then really now with a less, a, a smaller infusion of seats at the elementary level, um, your overall utilization goes from 88% up to up to 91% um, percent utilization overall. So with this one, we're actually able to, since we have a 6-8 component, look at that pink South Norwalk attendance zone as um, a, a way to be able to provide education to those students that are in there. Um, but what we noticed when we went through um, the further analysis of looking at the 6-8 um, enrollment a little bit closer, we only have 168 seats available at that magnet school based on the two section per grade model. So we're running a little bit of a seat deficit there um, of just over 50 seats overall. So the utilization there um, would be much higher. That's not to say that if there were greater choice options or more robust magnet programming at the middle school level that students wouldn't opt out um, and the seat count wouldn't become an issue. Um, but this is just really just looking at it from an attendant zone um, geographic level um, simply for this facility planning um, and uh, realizing that, you know, either there would needs to be a larger number of seats there or there needs to be the programming to better be able to support that, um, support that population. Scenario five, um, and as we've kind of built up from 726 seats to 756, um, now to just over 940 seats. Um, this is the largest component with a new South Norwalk Neighborhood Elementary School of 414 um, students with a new Columbus Magnet of 528 student K-8. And um, this is looking at having that um, K-8, really the 6-8 um, component of it at three sections per grade to be able to provide um, some richer choice options there for students to be able to opt in as part of the magnet programming. So this one um, falls closer to um, the first scenario, scenario six, um, with our attendance zones really kind of mirroring that. So I won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, even the neighborhood attendance zone was the same one that was used for um, our, our first scenario, scenario six. Um, so you know it really does a good job of creating that um, continuity there. Really the, the main difference for this one is really that middle school seat count and the middle school um, utilization. Um, so with this one, we were able to um, support a 414 student South Norwalk Elementary School with the Columbus Magnet. Um, we looked at about 90% utilization there to be able to provide um, several seats there for students looking to opt in. Obviously it's not the same number that we were able to provide in the earlier options um, that had a greater number of elementary seats. Um, but overall, it still provides some, some choice programming or some magnet programming. Um, looking at the 6-8 component for this school, um, knowing that um, we're using that same pink attendance zone, um, we were able to then, uh, based on 252 or three sections per grade at the middle school, accommodate the entirety of the um, South Norwalk middle school students there as part of that while still having some additional seats as part of it. Um, so through this exercise, um, the effusion of seats, especially at the middle school level, took us from that first option, the option six, where we were just right under that 100% utilization. It brought us down to about 91% utilization. So a little bit more comfortable level, um, but it did add you know, a, a very large infusion of seats there really through the middle school, bringing it up to about 940 seats. Um, and it did do a good job of being able to meet what the objectives were overall of providing access to schools um, for the South Norwalk neighborhood on the continuum from kindergarten all the way through eighth grade. 
Um, so with these, these are just really kind of drafted together to, you know, be different, um, to be able to be discussed, to be able to get input on it, um, be able to then see is just the infusion of seats enough or, you know, are we on the cusp of having a greater conversation about um, the future of some of the grade levels and looking at being able to really move the needle and move the ball forward of, of what it would look like to be able to have um, you know, greater choice programming as part of as part of what Norwalk is offering there. So with that, I'll turn it over to the board and I'm happy to go back and and roll up the sleeves and dig into any of the questions or any of the options. Hopefully this wasn't um, wasn't too much information um, all at once. Uh, I just want to say first, uh, thanks, Mike. And uh, we did cover a lot there. I hopefully uh, uh, anybody in attendance can see how some of these scenarios are, uh, as Dr. Shreya said earlier, uh, related to um, some of the findings from our uh, full-scale facility study that has us um, uh, building a new K-5 school in South Norwalk and an expanded CMS uh, K-8 in South Norwalk as well. So that's why, you know, we can see how there's multiple scenarios uh, to review. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, I just wanna open it up to my colleagues. Uh, if you have any questions, comments. Uh, just to get the ball rolling, Mike. Um, we talked about, you know, uh, the extent to which Norwalk has um, already made strides towards being a, a district of choice. And of course, we've already um, done a lot of work in that regard. Um, you know, I think to a certain extent that already exists, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, students can opt to go into a school out of their uh, zoned district uh, based on availability and based on a, on, on a particular uh, request. Um, my question to you is, Looking at a uh, scenario, I kind of lost count, the one with, um, I think it was scenario five with, um, I, I think four and five with um, uh, middle school space at CMS. Mm -hmm. You uh, have um, uh, sort of assumed uh, different uh, levels of neighborhood preference uh, in, in those scenarios. And I wonder, would that be the case then if we instituted, um, different kinds of magnet programs, uh, and this is a big if, uh, at other middle schools, would you assume the same kind of neighborhood preference at other schools around town? Yeah, I think based on availability of seats, we always want to leave something. I, I, I kind of teased it out a little bit with giving you a couple different levels just to be able to see. And some of them were demographically driven where we had some additional space. Um, I. Yeah, I've been doing this for a long time and I'm a big believer in um, magnet and choice really works if especially when you have a two way flow of students moving back and forth um, between the different neighborhoods, between the different offerings and options. That's when it really kind of um, excels at creating a unified district, a, you know, a unified culture. Um, so I would look at being able to provide the op the options in strategic locations and that they would have to be um, interesting enough for those to be able to leave a neighborhood to be able to go there for and seek them out. Um, so I think always a good starting point is creating the space and the size of the magnet really depends on several things. And one of that is just the level of busing um, as well as the level of transportation as part of it, but also um, you know, what some of the underlying demographics are. If you have a school that's very steady in enrollment um, you know, you may have slow growth there in order to be able to bring a very robust choice program online versus if you have a school that has some space um, and the facility fits for it, that may be a great candidate to be able to draw students into there. So I think it's really about opportunities. It's about the staff there um, and it's about creating the culture in the right in the right space and building. Yeah, creating those pull factors. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Colin, you know, I just want to mention for the public's benefit that the board spent this week going through this presentation with Dr. Estrella. So although we may not be asking questions 
out loud here. Um, she heard our questions in advance of the presentation and integrated them into tonight's presentation. That's a good point, Erica, thank you. I, I think Sarah was muted. It's, it was equipment over here. Um, if I can just jump on the back of what Erica was saying. Um, I think often we spend so much time looking at these things and researching these things and reading these things um, that, I mean, I know my eyes sometimes swim when I see all of this information. And I just want to reiterate that this, what's happening tonight is not a process that is leading to any outcome that there will be significant opportunity for input and revision of whatever comes of this discussion. I think um, just in my experience on the board, a lot of times people will look at a piece of information and they will say, oh, and they will sort of seize on it, you know, because there's so much information. Uh, so I just wanted to reiterate that for fun. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. And, you know, um, Mike, perhaps uh, because we do have um, a number of uh, folks in attendance tonight, one of the questions that I know has come up, um, you know, uh, tonight and on, on social media and so on is uh, the nature and uh, kind of uh, essence of these kinds of demographic studies. I think people, you know, may have questions about, well, what does this mean for me and my family? So maybe if you can kind of talk about, you know, kind of what happens next, the kind of the range of options that um, that this data can be used for? That, that, that's a great question. So um, many times when um, we're going through a, a client, maybe going through a school facility master plan, a school consolidation plan, a school construction plan, um, you want to be able to understand not only your total enrollment, your enrollment in the buildings, but when you're talking about potentially building schools and you want to be able to understand the geographic component. So that's where um, we go through and we create scenarios. I've done many of these that have resulted in um, school construction projects. I've done these that haven't. I've done these where early on we're talking five, six different scenarios and concepts of what could happen. And then ultimately after the school's built, um, it doesn't look like any of that. And because it's typically through planning, design and construction, it takes a number of years to create a facility and then you wait for the school year to populate it. And by then the work that we do early on in this initial planning creates a lot of thought of saying, boy, I don't want to do that because um, I think that's a detriment to um, these certain goals that we have or these certain neighborhoods. Um, and that process made us realize that, you know, that might not be the best solution. Um, and you want to go through it early so that when um, you, know, you, ultimately plan to open a school, you're not starting at square one of thinking, what are those what ifs? Um, and the same token, some things that come out of this process, um, they're great, they're, they, they sort of start to get good ideas. And it's just that continuum of, of planning never stops of saying, wow, we, we saw what works, we saw what didn't work. So now we know where to focus our efforts over the next few years of as we talk about school construction, investment and reshaping where we need to go. So this kind of process allows things to be able to play out, and get input on it um, before you just jump right in and do. Um, so I think it's a great process for that. And a lot of what we do starts at this level where we're throwing things out. Um, and unfortunately, um, a lot of information gets moved around and out there that this is like eminent and it's happening. And I, and I feel bad that um, you know, people get upset about it, but it's typically um, you know, what you need to be able to go through to understand um, there's only certain ways to populate a school. It's through attendance zones. It's through magnet and choice. Um, it, it's through, you know, grade groupings. Um, and to be able to have high functioning and highly utilized facilities, you need to be able to see what combination of those works best for um, your district and, and what you want to achieve. Mike, did I hear you say that you have to, to, you have to go through scenarios and submit them to the state? That was part of the presentation? Yeah, the state will ask and the state will ask 
and, and this is a good slide for an example of the state's going to ask, well, if you build in, the, in this scenario, we had 700 and just for you know rough planning. And I don't want people to get wed to that 726. That was kind of my planning number. When you develop ed specs and a program that's going to go there, that number slightly changes. So, you know, this is just a planning number. The state will ask, well, do you really need these seats? And what does it do overall to your buildings, to your utilization? Um, and really the main number is this bottom number here. Um, they, they really look at what does it mean overall for the district? And they wanna know that um, the seats are needed within the target areas. So in order to be able to be responsive to the questions to receive a state grant, um, we need to be able to submit um, an enrollment projection report that accurately captures um, what the demographics look at at the various neighborhoods. I have a question. <clears throat> you, you know, we're discussing planning and we're talking about years. How often during the planning do you look at enrollment? I've gone back and we have a number of years of enrollment. Um, what we will typically do once we feel like um, from the facility standpoint, so there's some agreement on the type of school, what grades are gonna be offered, is it magnet, how would that work? Um, we would be required by the state to project out eight years. So we would look ahead eight years of what the enrollment would look like and be able to provide that to them. Um, under this build scenario with the caveat that it's conceptual and the district will obviously be implementing their master plan, strategic plan, and there's other changes, um, but we, we would be required to at the minimum look eight, eight years ahead. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Mike. I think uh, some of this context is extremely helpful in helping us understand the slides in this presentation and it's with a little bit more nuance. Any other discussion questions from my colleagues? So if I can just sum up per the why, I think there were a lot of questions from parents this evening. Why, why are we a study that addresses questions of potential redistricting and things like that? Why at this time? And the answer is, so it would seem, and totally correct me if I'm wrong, the state requires that we go through these scenarios in order for us to be able to build a school that we need to serve children. Is that a good summary? That is a good summary. And um, we also wanna ensure that if we're putting a school in South Norwalk to serve the South Norwalk neighborhood, that um, it's the right size. I mean, that's part of the due diligence of not just picking a random number and say, I think a 500 student school would be perfect there. I mean, is it too much? Is it too little? little? You don't want to, you don't want to overbuild, you don't want to underbuild, but you also want to meet your charge of providing the seats there. Um, and then ultimately, in order to be able to get the state grant reimbursement, we have to be able to package this up and they're going to review it and they're going to ensure that yes, what Norwalk determined was this is the right amount, the right size, a good project. They agree with it. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. And, and to add to Sarah's point, you know, there's a community of students uh, who are without a community school uh, that are, I, I believe Dr. Sure you can correct me around the travel time, but around 40, 45 minutes traveling um, out of this community, you know? So in the sense of how uh, intentional we are as the board of keeping our students interest first, uh, it also is that, why that's answered from this report, I hope. And you are correct. Um, we have students um, that have been traveling 45 to an hour on a daily basis to get to their point, their school uh, location. The other thing that um, not having a community school in, in their neighborhood creates is um, the lack of opportunity for, for parents to be fully immersed in the school community because um, in some cases, we have communities that don't have um, access to um, pr um, private transportation. And to get to some of the school locations across the district in public transportation is not that easily accessible. 
So having a school within the community will allow um, the, the South Norwalk community, particularly those students that don't have a, an attendance zone, an opportunity to really um, have their parents fully immersed in their learning experience because they will have better access to, to their schools. And, and I think that, I, I don't think anyone can disagree with the importance of that um, and how pivotal that is to, to build a strong learning community for our students. Um, and I, and like um, Mr. Subar articulated, you know, the, these are scenarios that will, will solicit a lot of conversation, but it's necessary conversations that need to happen as we continue to map and think through um, the design of the new school for South Norwalk. Um, I think the feedback this, this evening provides us additional context of some of uh, the concerns within the community. And as we think about the best way to make sure that enrollment is balanced across the district and that we don't wind up with a situation where a school doesn't have enough students to um, successfully function, we, we want to make sure that we're looking at how shifting students will could potentially positively or negatively influence that. And um, we want to be well prepared when we engage with the state in this conversation um, to be able to provide them with different scenarios, alternatives, and, and ways in which we have been thinking about um, enrollment trends and patterns as a result of um, shifting students from, from different locations to a new location and the impact of that um, in the district at large. Can I um, ask a question in terms of where are we gonna now go with this? Um, you know, we've been at this for six years now and we have nothing. So, we spent a bunch of money and we have plans for different schools. And anyway, we, we still have not broken ground and it's six years later. So we now are being presented here. Uh, you know, the city's tried to question the demographics, but I think this study proves that the numbers are there and we know this, there's a need for a new school. So how are we gonna proceed from here? And which of these scenarios, how are we going to decide which of these scenarios we might go with? So I, I think first and foremost, the, the, one of the pivotal things that um, this uh, study allowed us to, to demonstrate is that there is a need. And I think that's going to be really important as we immerse in a deeper conversation with the state. Um, we have a scheduled meeting plan May 20th to um, have an initial conversation with the state about... Um, our enrollment numbers, making sure that their parameters and, and guidelines align um, to the current des um, design in terms of our current projected numbers, how um, pre-K and other enrollment patterns will influence um, projected numbers and the current enrollment and overall enrollment of the district at large. Um, so I, th I think the first step is going to be that um, uh, May 20th conversation with the state to um, talk about our current enrollment patterns and to talk about the need to get feedback from them of potential um, areas that we need to further consider. In, in terms of the actual school by school enrollment patterns and their influence, I mean, this is one of many other conversations we need to have so that we, we um, bring forward the best possible design. One, to um, provide students that don't have an attendance zone with an attendance zone, but also to ensure that we don't have a, negatively, a negative ripple effect in enrollment patterns across the, uh, across the district as students are now um, staying within their, their home uh, area. So, the feedback that the community provided today, the feedback that we are gathering in this conversation, it's really going to inform um, Mr. Suba and his team, as well as our team to now continue the conversation uh, about the things we need to take into consideration based on community input, as well as um, some of the questions that the board has um, surfaced today. 
And if there are any additional questions that surface as, as we continue to engage in the, conversa the conversation this evening. So the May 20th will be the next step. Uh, we would have a board meeting that first week of June. So you at that time would give us an update on how that went. And Correct. so we're, we, we definitely won't be filing an, an ED, uh, you know, an EDO 29 by June 30th, obviously, because we don't have enough time. So we'll be working on this for the next year. So the goal is um, to work on this uh, for the next year. Um, we also, we presented an initial scenario um, when the, when we started the facilities conversation previously about looking at the current um, CMS site and the possibility of um, building uh, the, the two schools there. Obviously um, there was community concern. We wanna have an opportunity and we have scheduled um, and I'm sorry, I think I, I might have uh, misspoken in terms of the date with the state um, uh, meeting, but it's, it's now in May. Um, but we also have a community meeting uh, with the South Norwalk community because we want to solicit feedback from them in, in terms of understanding what their hopes and dreams are, um, particularly um, our parents, um, for, for the plans moving forward. And um, I know the mayor and his team has, have made a commitment to acquire land um, in South Norwalk that will allow us um, enough space to build um, the, the one to build the new um, CMS as well as um, the South Norwalk school. The, the question has been, you know, given the resources we currently have, how large would, would these two schools be? One, two, what, what will be the impact of the different potential um, sizes of these two, uh, these two schools? What, what would that impact be in terms of the, the demographics and enrollment across the system, which is part of what um, some of the scenario conversations that are happening today were intended to do. And um, once we, we have more information gathered from the community in terms of their perspectives and, and how they think their each the different communities are best served, then we can make a better formed decision. But our goal is um, hopefully by June of 2022 that we can move forward with an application. And since you're on this call, the board's on this call and the mayor's on this call, can we talk about money? I know there have been a lot of buzz oh that there is not enough city capacity to fund all the different projects we uh, are planning on. So is that actually the case? And if so, how would we make a decision as to prioritize what projects? I mean, obviously Jefferson is ground is broken, is working, I mean, that's underway. So that's not gonna be stopped. Um, Cranberry is on the final planning stages, but we haven't broken ground yet. Um, and and then there's the the Norwalk High project, and then what we're trying to do in South Norwalk. How's how how is that going to get prioritized? So I think one of the things that we were looking at um, in terms of the South Norwalk project, uh, so I, and I'm going to say South Norwalk and CMS because the way we're looking at. Um, this project is creating a campus um, with some shared um, facilities. So when, when thinking about this, the funding has been allocated for this work the, the, in terms of the land, land acquisition as well as the building of, of these two schools. Um, I know that uh, Jim Giuliano as well as Alan Lowe gave us um, estimates about how, uh, in terms of the size of the facility, and we're talking about approximately a site that can um, hold um, 750 students. So the funding for a campus of that size in conjunction to the, uh, the land acquisition, those funding, that funding and resources there. And in my conversation with the mayor, um, he, I, and he can speak for himself, but like he's very committed in making sure that um, South Norwalk 
um, has the school that um, we've been talking about for a number of years now and that the, the, the community um, really deserves to have. I, I think every child should have access to a school that they can walk to in their community. And um, this will afford that opportunity. In terms of the Cranberry Project, the, that is an ongoing project that's moving um, its course uh, well. And, and um, I know that the architects completed um, some of their final designs. There was uh, the, the SGC engagement, community engagement, making sure that things were in alignment with what um, they envisioned for the school. So that's moving um, successfully and well. Um, and the conversations around Norwalk High School have continued. Um, the approvals that, ha that needed to happen so far have taken place. Obviously, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, to, fin to, to continue that project moving forward. Did I miss any of your, uh, any other project? That no, you no, I think you covered it all. I, I mean, I'm still worried about the money and since the mayor's on the phone, maybe he can tell us, I know he conceptually is behind all these projects, but how is this, you know, based on what the city CFO has said that, you know, the bonding of all this is not possible. Um, what, how, how, how are we gonna make these decisions? It's not that it's not possible. He has a limit where we um, where we can get to, and we're under that limit right now. So as we move forward and we prioritize the projects, the money will be allocated. The, the bonding is in place. The money has been authorized for Columbus, for Norwalk High School, for uh, Cranberry School, and for the Jefferson renovation. Right now, we're below the threshold uh, that we need to be in order to save our AAA bond rating. But we have a plan that will get us back to the area that is a is a more of a comfort zone. So uh, we're in good shape. So we can do all these projects, whatever, in the next five years without impinging on that AAA rating. Absolutely. My, okay. I, I, just to interrupt, I didn't hear anything about the South Norwalk School I heard um, <laughs> the other schools, but I didn't hear the, the new South Norwalk school. Can we go back to that or did I miss here? No, I think you're, I think it was, it was not included, but I think maybe that was just an accident. I mean, is that, that's bonded as well, I believe. We have, we have money in place for a new South Norwalk school. Right now, we also have money in place for the acquisition of property where that school will be built. We just have to now, as Dr. Estrella said, we have a meeting, I believe she's right on May 20th with the state to go over the long-term plans, the short-term plans and let them know uh, where we are and uh, get their feedback on it. But um, right now we have the money in place for the acquisition of land and for the building of uh, two schools on that one piece of property that will accommodate approximately 750 people, uh, students, I'm sorry. So that would be a new, a new Columbus, yes. a South Norwalk neighborhood school, plus Cranberry, finishing Jefferson and doing Norwalk High. That That's could all correct. be done. Keep our AAA rating within roughly the next five years, which is when all these projects would hit. Uh, that that is correct. I'm not sure it'll be five years. It might be six as we move forward. Okay. I don't know um, how quickly we're going to be uh, starting the the new Norwalk High School. Uh, right now, the priority is the South Norwalk School, as well as uh, finishing up on Jefferson and Cranberry. And um, obviously, if we have a two schools on the new property in South Norwalk, then we have to determine what's gonna happen with the old Columbus. Right. Um, I mean, there's an opportunity for the old Columbus um, that we've only begun to explore. Okay, so- I, I'm sorry, Sarah. Sherelle, uh, your question was answered. So I just have one follow-up question. I just need someone to walk me through the timeline for land acquisition. So we're, we're, we're looking at 2022, June 2022, but where does the land acquisition fall? Is, do we have to wait until 2022? Do we um, have a good faith you know, effort that we will purchase the land prior to 2022? I just, if someone can just walk me 
through that process? When we start uh, to look at a school, especially a new school, we have to um, determine design. We have to look at the programmatic things that will be, you know, how is the school uh, going to operate, how many students and so forth. Once we get that information, then we move forward with land acquisition. So, so, uh, so to just add to what the mayor is saying, um, the next one of the next steps for the board and one of the things we're hoping to have um, for uh, review and approval by the board in June is the ed specs for um, the new South Norwalk CMS um, campus. And that's this June, Dr. Estrella, or this, June This June, this June. Okay. Um, once the board approves the ed specs, then the city can then take the next steps right. um, around land acquisition that, that need to happen in order for us to then be able to submit a proposal, proposal. June 2022 to um, the state because we need to have land acquisition. Pro land acquisition prior to submitting an application. Right. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. But we're on the record here, just so everyone knows, we can do all this. Thank you. Colin, I just wanted to, um, there's some questions that have been happening in the chat that I just wanted to clarify. It seemed as if there was some confusion about this May 20th meeting, which is not about redistricting in any way. I just wanted to, to clarify that this meeting with the state is about um, using the data that we have gathered to talk about uh, new school construction and steps that we have to take to do that. It seemed like that just needed to be clarified based on the chat there. Hi, Dr. And, Sarah. Um, and I, I also wanted to just jump in and say that, you know, I, my understanding of the bonding is that, you know, when we think about these projects, you know, 40 million here and 40 million there, we're not bonding the entire amount at once. We're bonding it as we go along. Um, and, you know, even in my brief stint on the council, um, you know, Mr. Dakowitz himself was somebody who was a really good um, strategist when it came to refinancing the city's bond bonding so that uh, it freed up more bond capacity. So it's, it's kind of a rolling capacity. Uh, when we think about doing uh, whatever the, the total amount of millions is at the same time, it does seem like impossible, but uh, we have to remember that we're only bonding the, the money as, as it becomes required. But Colin, the other thing to remember is you have to bond for 100%. You don't get reimbursed until after it's done by the state. So even though we've got, we're, we've got this little carrot of 80% on NOG high, we have to pay for it all up front. Absolutely. Any other questions um, about uh, the democracy report? Um, well, Colin, I'm sorry, if I can just interject just for one minute, there's, we have the Q&A open and there's been a, a slew of questions. So I'm not sure if we're addressing some of those questions or if we can address it now, or we'll be doing that at a later time. Yeah, this is, a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a regular business meeting, Heidi, so we don't yeah. always have the capacity to answer audience questions. Um, if you are, if, if you would like to bring one of those questions or two into the meeting, uh, please feel free. I'm just noticing there's a bunch on here and that's all. I just wanna make sure that the community knows that we see them and that they'll at least be answered at some point. Um, and I know that we have public comments um, usually in the beginning of our business meetings and I understand that, but I, I just had noticed that there were more questions popping up. No, I appreciate that, Heidi. And, and, and yes, it's a good thing to note. Um, I actually don't even see the questions on my screen. So I'm oh, really? Okay. Uh, um, but yes, we are currently now in the business part of the meeting and so, um, it is not a Q&A with the audience okay. at this point. But so, I am opening up to uh, my colleagues for any questions. If somebody is able to see the chat um, and wants to raise one of these questions, I, I'm not going to object to that. I don't know where I click to see them. Yeah, I mean, there's just something under q and I, I guess my point is, I think whether we answer some now or we just wait that, you know, we hear, you know, we're noticing that they're up and we just wanted to address that, that maybe at some point, maybe later on or tomorrow, staff can answer some of their concerns. That was the reason why I brought it up. Absolutely. Thank you, Heidi. But, and I do think though with this process, you know, we, we don't have a 
you know, a policy or procedure for dealing with this Q and A, and we probably should 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 have something so that the public knows what to expect and that these questions are not just going to outer space. Um, one person here did did ask about if redistricting is not being considered. Why was this report commissioned? Well, I think they 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 have to understand we're looking at the demographics. We're trying to figure out how to build a school in South Norwalk and how everyone will get to beat up. So um, I think we answered that question, although maybe not specifically. Uh, and then there was a question about a follow-up meeting regarding redistricting. Well, I don't think redistricting is on the table right now, if I'm correct. Uh, and, um, you know, I guess the follow-up meeting is what's the date of that community meeting, Alex, in South Norwalk? Is that May 24th? Uh, May 24th, but it's not to discuss um, right. the no, no. It's more just to get um, but uh, a different I think it would be a it would be a follow-up to this meeting. You'd be able to give some color on how things went with the state on the 20th. Correct. So it, it would be a, the, the probably the next public update. Today is what, May 4th. So mm -hmm. it would be the next public update uh, or the 4th, right? So 20 days later, we'll have some kind of an update. And Alex, Sorry, it's, May, it's actually May 25th, just to be clear. We, we have oh, Alex, thank you. Can you let me know how, how you said that Brenda was working on this, how did she determine who was going to be in that meeting and how is she getting the notices out to all parents? So we are, work, like, the flyers were created and we're using the student dis distribution list through PowerSchool to identify students that live in the area. Okay, and who else was included in, in this? Because I recall asking, but I don't recall receiving anything at all. She will be sure. sending the, no go ahead. You Cheryl, they have not gone out yet because we were just finalizing the exact date to make sure um, that everyone was available. So they have not yet gone out, but they are drafted um, in three languages. So. And that's fine, Brenda, but I'll talk to you offline. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, and Alex, I just want you to go back to my email that I sent and hope that everybody that we're following that inclusivity process. If we don't have any other comments or questions, um, I do want to thank Mr. Zuba. I think it's helpful to have uh, some of the context to see how the data that we were presented with tonight is related to our larger facilities um, planning uh, and vice versa. So I, 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 I'm glad that we had a lot of people in attendance tonight, and I hope it was um, some helpful context. And thank you, Dr. Shreya, for walking us through it. Thank you, Chair. Um, and hopefully this is one of many other conversations. I just want to give a special thank you to uh, Mr. Zuba for um, working uh, expeditiously through this process with us and really taking the time to look at uh, an array of different scenarios that will help us better understand the impact of enrollment patterns in the district, particularly as we're thinking about building a new school and um, how that will influence in, in different ways the enrollment numbers across the system. So thank you. I You're second welcome. that, thank you. It was very helpful for me. I'm very visual, so it was very helpful for me. So thank you. And that concludes the superintendent report. Excellent. Thank you again. Thanks for all the wonderful discussion. Um, that leads us into the action section of tonight's meeting, uh, starting with the approval of budget transfers. Tom Hamilton was able to walk us through those um, transfers earlier at the meeting. Um, does anybody want to make a motion to approve these transfers? So moved. Thank you, Terrell. Any second? Thank you, Diana. Okay. Uh, is there any further discussion about the budget transfers? Hearing none, why don't we go ahead and uh, call up for a vote. All in favor of approving the budget transfer, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. 
the budget transfers are approved. And I wanted to just a note here, um, because I did not know exactly how long the meeting would go, um, I did suggest uh, to uh, Mr. Hamilton that the March 2021 financial report, which is under information and reports and which does not require board action tonight, could be tabled uh, until uh, the finance committee meeting. Usually we would, we would see it at the finance committee meeting first anyway, but because of the switch this month, uh, we haven't. Um, so that he could not have to stick around and he could enjoy his, his week off. Um, I'd like to, if, so, if that's okay with everybody, I'd like to get a motion to table the, the March financial report. Thank you, Erica, uh, and seconded by Heidi. All in favor of tabling the, the March financial report, please say aye, raise your hand. Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Next, we have approval of personnel. And looking at the agenda, we have uh, five appointments, uh, some resignations and retirements. Can I get a motion to move this forward? Thank you, Erica, seconded by Diana. Uh, is there any uh, discussion about the personnel approvals? Hearing none, we can go to a vote. All in favor of approving personnel uh, tonight, please say aye or raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, unanimous. Welcome to all of those appointments. Moving on, we have the appointment of Jacqueline Ahrens, principal of Wolfit Elementary. And um, I want to just say thank you to the uh, Wolfit SGC for including this wonderful letter of, uh, of, of testimony in favor of, of uh, Principal Aarons. Um, can I get a motion to move this forward? Suzanne, thank so you. Second, Godfrey, I'll get you next, row. Any uh, discussion about uh, Jackie Aarons over at Wolfit? Um, I know Jackie Aarons is here with us today. So I don't know if it's okay with you, um, Chairman, if we could give her a moment to say a few words. I would love that. Hey, Jackie. Hi, everyone. Good evening. It's so nice to see everybody today. And I'm so very excited to be with you and to accept this appointment. I just wanted to say I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the Wolf Pit community, the SGC, the PTA, just my parents in general. Um, it has been such a welcoming and supportive um, community to work in. And I've just been humbled and overwhelmed with the show of support that I have uh, received in uh, this appointment and also just throughout this entire school year, uh, just the daily support and encouragement. Um, it's just been awesome as we've navigated this very uh, weird and interesting school year. And I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the amazing faculty at Wolf Pit. Um, the faculty and staff uh, through everything, through my tedious arrival and dismissal rehearsals. Yes, rehearsals, we rehearsed it. We're an integrated <laughs> art school. Um, they just bared with me as I reshaped the entire building, moved every classroom, as I've had impromptu dance parties with the kids. Um, they've endured it all and encouraged it all and supported it all. And, you know, when I see the passion that they bring to our kids every day, it just inspires me to work that much harder. And lastly, I can't say enough about our students at Wolf Pit, my scholar artists who every day uh, bring sunshine into the room, um, their energy, their curiosity, their creativity. Um, again, it just encourages me to do my best work and to make sure that I advocate to open every door to them, every opportunity that they can have, I want to provide for them. Um, so I just want to thank you all uh, for giving me this opportunity to be the official leader of the Wolf Pack. And I'm just so excited about the future of Wolf Pit School. So thank you all. Mm. And our thanks to you, Jackie. I don't think anybody could have said it any better. Um, so let's, let's, I'd like to make it official. All in favor of approving Jacqueline Aaron, just uh, principal of Wolfit Elementary, please say aye, raise your hand. I'm not even, not, not even gonna call for a post. I'm gonna call that unanimous. Thank you so much for everything you're doing.
Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. So excited. Thank you so much. Your enthusiasm is contagious. We're so excited. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a part of the community. Anytime you come in, it, that's how, and, and I, Dr. Case, I'm your favorite school, right? Dr. Case already knows I feed her. We, you know, we, we do all kinds of fun things. That's how it goes, right? It's great. <laughs> Thank you all. I'm jealous, Jackie. <laughs> I feed you too. <laughs> Now every school is going to be feeding everybody. So that's uh, we we'll have a community it. garden. You're all welcome. <laughs> Fantastic. Again, thank you. And thank welcome. You. Thank again to the Wolford SGC for their help in that. Um, next, we have the approval of the final plan specifications and cost estimates for district oil tanks. Um, this was covered in our last facilities meeting. It's um, uh, what was uh, part of the uh, capital appropriation last year to uh, extract and replace buried oil tanks in some of our school buildings. In some cases, they won't be replaced because they're moving to a different energy source, but it is part of what has already been a uh, part of the capital expenditure. Uh, is there a move, uh, motion to move this forward? Diana, thank you, seconded by Erica. Any discussion about these uh, oil tanks? Seems pretty straightforward. All in favor of uh, approving these uh, oil tank removal, please say aye or raise your hand. Thank you, any opposed? Any abstentions? It moves unanimously. Next, speaking of school construction projects, we're uh, excited to see the plans for furniture uh, technology uh, and uh, specs and cost estimates for Jefferson Elementary. This was also um, presented at uh, the last month's facilities meeting. Is there a motion to move this forward? Erica, seconded by Suzanne. Any further discussion? Of the furniture and fixtures. I just wanna say, you know, kudos to the, the design team, the architects there. I think they're doing a really great job of trying to uh, think about current and future needs and also leveraging existing assets and managing the costs as much as possible. So uh, thanks to them. And I will call this for a vote. All in favor of approving the FFNE at uh, Jefferson, please say aye or raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Sorry, Mike, was that your hand? No, okay, thank you. That moves forward unanimously. Thank you all. And now, um, speaking of contagious uh, enthusiasm, uh, we have as an, a board action item, the recognition of Teacher Appreciation Week. And we do have a recognition that I, I'd like to be read into the meeting. And it says, Teacher Appreciation Week, from May 3rd, 2021 to May 7th, 2021. The Newark Board of Education is proud to recognize the week of May 3rd as Teacher Appreciation Week in Norwalk. During what has been an incredibly challenging year, our teachers have continued to face obstacles with pride, commitment, and strength. Throughout the national crisis, teachers have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. They have remained positive, creative, flexible, and supportive adapting to scenarios that we never before thought possible. Whether our students are in-person, remote, or hybrid, NPS teachers have made it their goal to ensure that each student has the tools they need to succeed academically and from a social emotional perspective. NPS teachers have learned and implemented a variety of new skills in a short amount of time. They have risen to meet many challenges, including honing new technology skills to apply to daily lessons, utilizing apps and programs to aid in student learning. Teachers have moved classrooms, taught in cafeterias and gymnasiums, and ensured safety measures such as social distancing and face masks. Teachers have engaged learners in the classroom while ensuring a fully interactive experience for those at home. On the drop of a dime, they have transitioned from in-person to virtual without missing a step. 
teachers have done all of this and more, all while prioritizing our students. In addition to adapting to being an educator during a pandemic, teachers continue to work with students on facing day-to-day -day challenges and opportunities. Our teachers impart life lessons on the importance of accountability. They encourage students to think critically and drive them to excel in a variety of situations. Even during a pandemic, NPS teachers encourage students to be creative and develop skills and a love for learning that extends a lifetime. By recognizing Teacher Appreciation Week, the Norwalk Board of Education joins with students, families, and members of the community in recognizing our talented, dedicated, and determined people. We are grateful and inspired by the work they continue to do each day. Please enjoy this special message from our students and take a moment to thank a teacher today. Ralph, do we have that uh, message queued up? Oh, I don't believe I have a, a message. I just had the SEL in the presentation. Oh, okay. You. you know what? We don't even need it because, um, you know, the teachers are doing it um, not for the plaudits, but for uh, the, the love of the labor. And um, I just want to take any opportunity we, we can to applaud them. I mean, it's, it's, it's a giant work and they're doing it as if it's just any other day. Um, I would like to call for a board vote to approve this, uh, this recognition. Um, all in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Thank you, that's unanimous. Um, I don't know if any other board members have any comments. Just wanna open it up there. Well, I think the, the statement certainly spoke for itself. So thank you again to our wonderful, wonderful, wonderful teachers. Next on the agenda is a recognition of Nurse Appreciation Day uh, for May 12th. And we also have a statement to read in appreciation of our nurses. Uh, does anybody else want to read it? I just, I don't want to hog the time. All right, I'll go for it. The Norwalk Board of Education is pleased to recognize May 12th as School Nurse Appreciation Day in Norwalk. Throughout what has been an enormously challenging year, NPS nurses have gone above and beyond the call of duty to keep our students safe and healthy. As we continue to navigate through the national health crisis, Norwalk parents can feel confident that their children are in great hands with our school nurses. NPS nurses are the front line for staff and students, reinforcing COVID protocols and mitigating measures, working with students to maintain a healthy environment, utilizing isolation rooms when necessary and distributing PPE. They also provide education and training on COVID to employees throughout the district. Every NPS nurse is a critical part of the contact tracing team, working to get the job done to keep everyone safe and our students learning. Their dedication also goes beyond our schools, having volunteered at vaccine clinics for Norwalk employees and the community. In addition to pandemic health and safety, school nurses work through a variety of challenges each day, whether screening for health issues, dealing with injuries, responding to allergic reactions, administering medication, managing chronic diseases such as diabetes and asthma, and addressing the impact of behav behavioral health and social issues. In addition to working with students, school nurses interact with other professionals, including teachers, administrators, doctors, counselors, coaches, parents, social workers, and more to improve the safety, health, and academic achievement of all students in the school community. It is due to these interventions and actions performed throughout the day that Norwalk students are able to focus on academics and be successful at school. The school nurses at Norwalk Public Schools are caring and committed to our students by recognizing May 12th as School Nurse Appreciation Day, the Board of Education joins with our schools, families, and the community in distinguishing these dedicated professionals. <laughs> and as we heard earlier tonight, they barely take a day off. Um, and it, it's, it's 
truly, truly amazing work. So all in favor of recognizing May 12th as School Nurse Appreciation Day, please say aye or raise your hand. Unanimous, excellent, thank you. And again, thank you to our nurses. It's not easy, um, but they make it look easy. Colin? Yes. I wanted to quickly jump in. I was gonna hold my applause to the end for uh, both teachers and nurses. As a um, parent of a two elementary school children, I just want to recognize that our teachers this year not only taught in this environment, but they taught a new language. Watching my second grader learn control, alt, delete, and terms like backspace and you know typing in passwords that had caps and lowercase in them, it was you know a task in and of itself. And the nurses who welcomed them into the nurse's office and comforted them you know, in, in an environment that could otherwise have been very scary with, you know, the masks and the gowns, um, you know, especially for our little ones, the teachers and the nurses did a phenomenal job this year. Thank you. Yeah, Colin, I also wanted to, I know it, it's not in our agenda, but uh, May 1st was uh, Principal Appreciation Day. And I wanted to take the time to thank also the principals of all of our schools here at Nauk Public Schools and all the dedication and the hard work that they also have, you know, uh, moving these uh, schools and keeping them all, um, you know, in order and safe with these teachers and working together. And I know that everybody's putting in all the extra hours, you know, to educate the children and keep them safe and, you know, making sure that everybody is well, and taken care of. And it's just been a very, very difficult year. And thank you to all the principals. 1000%, yes. Thank you for those testimonials. Excellent, good. So yes, you know, that, that good news is contagious. Uh, so moving on, um, we do have, uh, Two more action items. One is uh, the approval of the elimination of 10-month CISD positions and creating 12-month CISD positions. This is something that was actually requested at the building level. These are roles that really require 12 months of work. Um, do I have a motion to move this forward? Heidi, thank you, I seconded by Erica. Uh, any discussion about this particular item? Okay, seeing that, and, and you know, we just talked about all the work that our professionals are doing. So it's clearly um, 12 months work uh, worth of it. Um, seeing no more discussion, all in favor of uh, approving these 12 months CISD positions, please say aye or raise your hand. Thank you, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, excellent. And last but certainly not least, we have the approval of summer school of the summer school credit process, which is something that we covered at our most uh, last curriculum meeting. Uh, it's a great program to help incoming for, uh, high school uh, freshmen uh, get some uh, credit. Uh, do I have a motion to move this forward? Suzanne, seconded by Sherelle, thank you. Um, is there any further discussion about this? Okay, seeing that, I just wanna you know, just say thanks again. I can't say thanks enough to our um, principals and uh, curriculum leaders at uh, Norwalk High School and Brian McMahon um, for putting this all together. All in favor of uh, the high school sum uh, summer credit process, please say aye, raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Excellent, thank you. And that concludes our action items for tonight's agenda. Next, we have our uh, information and reports, and we are, have voted uh, tonight to table the March financial report. We will uh, hear more about that from Tom Hamilton and Kristen and team, uh, the, the March Finance Committee meeting. And so I'd like to open it now for any committee reports or representative reports for anything that was not covered in tonight's agenda, anything that you think that we need a heads up on, anything that you wanna just uh, update us on. Uh, Sherelle, we'll start with you. No, I just wanted to make sure that uh, Karen Amaker was recognized too for PTEC in her part 
and the Summer Bridge Academy program. I just, I think um, all of the principals did a phenomenal job and I think it's um, proactive and just, um, we're all about equity and just, you know, um, having this as a point program to push kids over into, um, you know, the higher classes. I just, I just want to thank everyone. I think it's phenomenal. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that clarification. Yes. Any other committee or representative reports for tonight? Heidi? Yeah, I'll add in. Um, we had a policy committee, so it's been a, a productive night, long night. We started at 5.30 tonight. We had a presentation um, by um, an NAEYC um, accreditation presentation tonight by Ameris. Um, and just we, we're doing this kind of early. It's really not due until June of 2022, but we decided to kind of get the ball rolling. And, and she gave us some information that she's working on, as well as meeting with the state. The state's coming down here to Norwalk on Thursday. So we'll have more information in the coming months. In addition to that, we also had a school governance council policy uh, it's policy number 1211. It was just really a revision discussion. We also had Dory Antonetti um, from Shipman and Goodwin who had a presentation tonight. And again, it was clearly discussion only. So we're just looking at state statutes and what we have for school governance councils now. And we'll continue those discussions over the next few months. So I just wanted to give everybody an update. Excellent, thank you, Heidi. Sure. Um, one thing I will uh, say, um, just as a heads up, um, you know, um, Mike raised the very important question of uh, where is the money <laughs> earlier on? We have to make sure that as we think about all these grand plans that we, we think about also how to fund them. Uh, to that end, um, we will be scheduling a joint meeting of the Board of Education Finance Committee and the Finance and Claims Committee of the Common Council uh, in June. Um, where we are going to engage our, our colleagues on the council uh, on some of the, uh, the, the talking points from our new strategic plan. Um, we, wanna, we wanna get ahead of this. We wanna make sure that we engage um, our colleagues. And um, you know, when we, when, we, when we come to budgeting for some of these plans, we wanna make sure that um, everybody is, feels that they have been fully engaged in our own board. Of course, you know, uh, the mayor is here tonight. He is an ex officio member of the Board of Education. Sometimes it feels like it's one versus the other, but at the end of the day, we're all in this together, right? We sink or, sink or swim uh, as one. So I just, that's a heads up that's coming up in June. And I wanna thank my, um, uh, the, the chair of that committee, Greg Burnett for working with me on that. And if there's no other committee or representative reports, um, we can move on to just any uh, general board member announcements. Anything going on in your life you want to share? Well, okay. That sounds like it's 10 o'clock, and so we can keep it moving. Um, the only thing we have left for tonight is the approval of the minutes from the uh, April 6th meeting. Uh, the April 6th uh, board meeting and the April 12th board workshop on board practices. Uh, if there are no objections, we can move those together. Um, does, does anybody want to move, make a motion to move that forward? Heidi, thank you. Seconded by Godfrey, thank you. Are there any discussions, questions, changes to the minutes? Seeing none, we'll, we'll thank our note takers and call for a vote. Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes from April 6th and April 12th, please say aye or raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. That's all I had on the agenda. I don't know if I missed anything. Um, I just want to thank, uh, first, again, everyone for their contributions tonight. We had a lot of excellent uh, uh, comments from the community, great data-rich presentation from the superintendent and her team, uh, wonderful uh, discussion from the board and, uh, and, and other um, 
district staff. So again, really appreciate it. Another good meeting. Uh, thanks again to everyone. Is there one, any final motion? Erica motions to adjourn and it's seconded mm -hmm. by Godfrey. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. Okay, at 10.08, <laughs> thanks everyone. Have a wonderful night and a wonderful week. And see you next time. Thank night, you, everyone. everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.